Podcast number 867. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a portfolio or you want to sell products and or services or you just want to blog. You just want a longer blog than than basic bite-sized social media can provide for you. Uh, Squarespace gives you everything you need to make your next move into a reality, including a free domain. And not to mention with Squarespace beautifully designed templates and customizable features, you can create a beautiful website that is simple and intuitive, and you can just add and arrange your content with the click of a mouse. So start a free trial today. Squarespace.com. Enter the offer code NERDIST to get 10% off your first purchase. Now let's go to the Nerdist Community Corkboard. Um, first of all, the ID10T Festival, ID the number 10 T Fest. Dot com uh, is a festival that I created to essentially like try to make a music comedy festival, but with also kind of a comic con at the center of it. So uh, maybe you already know about it, maybe you don't. Go to id10tfest.com. Weezer is playing uh, TV on the radio. OK Go, uh, car seat headrest, tank and the bangers. Also, there's comedy stages with uh, Brian Posehn, Garfunkel and Oates, Michael Che, Dimitri Martin, Yasser Lester, Brant Weinbach. Uh, then there's a, like an EDM cosplay tent and then a whole like comic book creators. Uh, there's going to be panels. There's going to be podcasts. So there'll be something to do all day long. Nothing really crashes into one another. It's just all day long stuff to do. So that's June 24, 25 in, uh, at, the, at Min Mountain View at the Shoreline Amphitheater. So please come to that. Get tickets. Come. Come, come. Um, also, Tony writes, I've been listening to the podcast for the last three years and it's helped me through some hard times when I was trying to get my show, Graham Cracker, up in Chicago. I've been working on some version of the show for the past 18 years and we have one weekend left, April 28 through 30. The show is a blend of theater and film and the cast is doing an amazing job. Uh, Graham Cracker explores the meaning of family heritage and identity through the lens of a young man faced with his last chance to see his estranged father again. To purchase tickets, go to bspfilm.com slash gc, which I assume stands for Graham Cracker. I'm going to guess. I'm going to go out on a limb. Or it stands for... Uh, Ed, listen to this business, Jonah Carey, who does a podcast on the Nerdist Network, Jonah, the Jonah, Car- Jonah Carey's podcast, uh, who is great... I've done his podcast. He's had a lot of sports people on. I'm not a sports person, obviously, but he's had a lot of sports people on. But he's just a great talker and a really nice guy. Jonah Carey, who's Canadian, uh, got Justin Trudeau, Canadian Prime Minister, in his first podcast appearance. They talk about Montreal Expos. They talk about running a country and more. So go to nerds.com and on iTunes and uh, look for Jonah Carey's podcast. That's K-E-R-I. And there you go. This episode is Dave Gahan of Depeche Mode. Depeche Mode uh, is uh, one of my favorite bands. And I met Dave at K-Rock a handful of months ago. And uh, no, I, mean, I guess probably like a year. Now a year has become a handful of months ago. It's probably like a year ago. And he was like, hey, I love At Midnight. And I'm like, how do you know that? I know who you are. You're not supposed to know who I am. And uh, at that time I said, hey, you should come on the podcast sometime. And it happened. Um, the Depeche Mode is about to do uh, another huge tour around their new album, Spirit. Uh, and the tour starts in a few weeks and is all over the world. Go to DepecheMode.com for tickets and info. But Dave is such a open, warm, wonderful guy. I mean, it's like you talk to him and you just you don't get the sense like, oh, this guy's the front man for one of the biggest bands in the history of music. But he was just uh, just so lovely to talk to. And I had uh, one of my best friends, April Richardson, sit in on the podcast because uh, uh, April is also... If I'm a big Depeche Mode fan, she's an even bigger Depeche Mode fan. And and uh, April's birthday was is in a couple days. And I'm like, you know what, April? It's your birthday. You need to come meet Dave Gahan and do the podcast. So it was great to have her on too. And uh, and uh, you know, it's kind of in a way celebrate April's birthday by hanging out with Dave Gahan. So wish April's at AP on Twitter. Wish her a happy birthday. It's in a few days. And uh, and yeah, and and Dave uh, Dave Gahan of Depeche Mode. Holy shit. This episode also brought to you by Stamps.com. Listen, guys, it saves you time and money from going to the frickin' post office. Stop doing that to yourself. Mail any letter package using just your computer and your printer, and then your mail carrier picks it up. No more hassle. Stamps.com never closes. You can print any kind of postage you want for a letter or package 24-7. It's convenient. It's reliable. It's flexible. It's easy. Uh, so they're going to send you a digital scale to automatically calculate the exact postage you need. You print it out so you're not wasting money. 
It's the exact thing you need in the exact way that you would need it. Um, right now, enjoy Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and that digital scale that I mentioned without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in NERDIST. That's Stamps.com into the promo code NERDIST. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. Now here's the Nerds Podcast number 867 with Dave Gahan of Depeche Mode. Oh, he's so wonderful. It's so interesting. All right, Katie, please roll the thing. Now entering Nerdist.com. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, cool. So the last time I saw you was uh, a K-Rock thing. I At think. the K-Rock yeah, the thing, yeah. It was very early. It was really early in yeah, the morning. Yeah, you were there before me too I as was. well. Which was <laughs> yes, I was. Because it, it's, it's, it's so far from where I live that I leave very early in the morning and some days – I could get there really early, or some days I could be late. I just don't oh, know because of Trevor. But I worked at K-Rock in the oh, 90s yeah. when it was in Burbank, and it was in that weird That's office right. It was building. in that where you used to, we used to have to go in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. If you drive in there, and there was, they'd announced it, there'd be a bunch of fans there, and they'd drive us underneath. You'd have to go underneath and, and then go up Yes, yeah, so I never really went in the front door of that place. But, yeah, they were there for a long time, and then... Years and years ago, um, it's funny because the other day I was listening to the radio, I was driving to rehearsals, and um, it was who used to be at K Rock, DJ, what was her name? What was it? Well, there was uh... really, uh, really old. I'm talking like 30 years ago. Oh, I don't. She was. Um, it wasn't Tam. Dusty, Str- Dusty, Dusty Street. Yes. Oh my God. And uh, she was on like the radio. I'm sure. So I was like, that, that can, can that be her? Because I. And I guess it was. She was doing like uh, she was on like uh, the, those shows of like classic vinyl. Or whatever. Yes, yeah. The Sirius absorbed Sirius, like yeah. all the everyone, like all the K Rock guys, uh, all the MTV people. But she used to be. It was K Rock was like a tiny little room, like it was just above somewhere, or this little like above a garage or something. Oh my gosh! And we got the same as same as in New York when it was like those like WDRE and right. stuff like that were these. You had to go out to Long Island. Oh my god! And, uh, and do that stuff when radio was different. a thing. <laughs> it, it was I really, think people it, it was different, wasn't it? it might, it's sort of like I don't know. It's different now. It's I don't, I'm not saying it's bad now or anything. It's just it's just really different. Well, there was definitely a hit machine going yeah. on in pop music, but yeah. you know when K Rock is like coming out of punk and Brit and Brit alt rock and like everything that we all got in the mm-hmm. early '80s here in the states. K Rock was, was the one. Yeah. It was the one. It was the one. Yeah, and it was very, I guess, much more alternative. Yes. Then it was playing stuff that you would not hear on the radio, like on the right. mainstream radio at all. Yeah. Same as WDRE in New York. That was what they were like as well. And predominantly, that's the only places we got played. Oh my so. god. Yeah, because by the time I started working at K Rock in '95, it already had become like a hit machine, and there were playlists, and you had to stick to the playlists, and it was already very. Yeah. You know, but they they kind of made it seem like oh we're yeah. just this ragtag, but it was a very right. programmed right. by that point. I uh, the lo- when I I um sorry, I just like, seem like I peed myself. No, that's all right. <laughs> um, you want want you to be comfortable. If you need to pee yourself here, Dave, we're, we're very you're nervous. Friends. Those days have gone, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, but uh, that's we can tell some stories about that. Uh, waking up in various bodily fluids is not fun. And hopefully uh, most of them are yours. You don't know. <laughs> You're never quite sure. You're never sure. You're never quite sure because of the memory lapse. Um, what? Where am I, first of all? What happened? And how did I get here? I'm in Munich, I'm in, you say? Yeah, I mean, it, it, things like that happened to me. Honestly, they really did. I would. It would be like, I mean, I'm in Amsterdam. I'm pretty sure I was in Berlin couple of days ago is that kind of thing well i mean even before then just the two like the touring musician schedule yeah I feel like that could happen so oh, anyway it, it still does anyway i'm still like it's the roadies i'm like still like <laughs> so, so, and, and they'll hold up you know so, so you like, good evening whatever <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. i still have that they actually put a big sign right on like where my monitors are oh, obviously that's hilarious. you know Bratislava. have you ever said the wrong city 
I have. I have. Yes, I've. Do you I've get booed definitely... or are they like what? No, you just get kind of looks from the front rows like. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, that's like yeah. Our but seriously, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but seriously, it's where great am to I? be here. Yeah. You. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure, it's great. Yeah. I mean, what was that? You know, I, I, listen. You know, I grew up. I was born in '71, so the '80s were really my formative years. And when I think back about it now, you're such a young man, Chris. I mean. <laughs> It doesn't feel like... I was born in 62. I know, but that's <laughs> only nine... You're only nine yeah, years. You're I only was, nine but years. That was, that was, but that was... You know, I was lucky to be born at that time because by the time I was getting to be a, to just my early teens, like 11, 12, music was pretty cool in England. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah you we got just, the We got the time. pistols and the damned and all these. But, but and before that, of course, I had Bowie and I had T-Rex. And I right. had, you know, so... And then suddenly... You know, Johnny Rotten was on TV, and, and my mum, I hate, you know, was like, oh, oh, he just, he just, oh, he just swore. I think he just, yes. he just, I think he said bollocks. You know, and I was like, I was like shaking, you know, it was so awesome. And just the effect it had on my mother, I was like, I'm in. That's what I'm, I'm doing this. This is what I'm doing. Well, it um, totally, like that era yeah. of, you know, because at the same time, you have this, like, British comedy explosion, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you have Python, you have all oh, these great... Was, yeah. That are basically just taking really button-up British yeah. culture and yeah. essentially just spreading their butthole. Yeah, I mean, Mon- Monty Python was, was like, the, the thing to watch. There was a few things, there was a few shows you watched. You watched Top of the Pops, you watched the old Grey Whistle Test... And you watch Monty Python. And mm. that was kind of it in England. Because when we only had the, all three channels, we had three, BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV. And, and they all ended at about like 11.30 as well. So you'd, <laughs> if you still watch it, just suddenly went to this little dot. Like, and you're like, oh, that's it. <laughs> Please come back. Yeah, oh, I guess we better go out and vandalize now. Please come yeah. back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, everything, everything closed early in England. Like all the bars closed. Everything closed early. Back every, everything. Nothing um, on Sundays. Um, yeah, I was reading that you were uh, well. You, I, and if you don't want to talk about any of this, please don't worry about it. We'll cut out anything you want to talk about. I, I will talk about anything, Chris, if you give me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, this this when I was uh, when I was really kind of digging around, like I don't really know that much about Dave's backstory. But to find out that you didn't know who your biological father was for the first handful of years of your life. No, quite a few years until my stepfather died when I was nine, actually. And I think it was because I was the young, my, my sister was older than me and they probably had kind of was. They tell me now that I did know this or like, you know, but I was too young to understand. But I definitely felt like because my, my stepfather also, my mother remarried, my father left when I was like six months or something so my mother remarried and then my my, my stepfather I thought was, was my dad had two younger brothers so Pete and Phil my brothers and um so and of course he was very affectionate to them sure I, and I was the older brother and I, I kind of always felt how did he treat I, you he didn't treat me bad or anything in fact he was you know I only got beaten a few times and I probably deserved it <laughs> um, he did take his belt off a couple of times for me Dude, which we was the terrifying same childhood. yeah we had literally same childhood really, like, my dad left and then my stepdad yeah, yeah totally yeah. He, he had two sons and he was not cool to me right and he was super okay cool to so them. it wasn't we do things like which I knew would, was odd even at a very young age like my brother Pete who was the next one down he would he just stop me if I'm no no please no, I'm please, into I will ramble on oh my god I'm um, so bored he, he, hurry he, up he he would um he would you know have my younger brother on his lap when he came in from work um and he worked um he worked for Shell Oil was in and uh, probably in some terrible refinery he died very very young he was only like forty seven or something so oh, he geez. probably he probably was breathing some horrendous fumes but um. He would put Pete on his lap. That would be the first thing. And Pete would help him to roll one of those cigarettes that came out the little tin box. Oh, right. You know, and you'd close it, and then the roll, roll, rolly cigarette. You know, kind kids of are so out. good at that because they're tiny hands. <laughs> and he was like five. They can really tight yeah, roll. Right. They can I was kind of like, you know, seven, going like, why don't I get to do that? <laughs> you know, because I wanted to have a go at that. I could do that. Um, and it was things like that, just little things. Um, he would give Pete like them like half a crown, and I would get a shilling. 
With, you know, as pocket money. It was things like that, like, like that. I thought there must be something wrong with me, even at a very young age. So then when he died, um, there we were, he was dead, and, and I watched him actually take his last, last breath. I came downstairs, and because I, I, I heard my mum sort of panicking and stuff, and I, I, I woke up, I came down, I looked around the door, and and I saw he was on the couch, and my mum was like leaning up, and he took, spluttered a bit and coughed, and, uh, and I guess died. Um, and my mum turned around and saw me, kind of looking, she said, you get up to stair- upstairs, you know. And the ambulance came. He was gone, never saw him again. Um, and then at the funeral, I was kind of a couple of times by a couple of uncles who were his side of the family. I was kind of like told I wasn't showing enough I guess I wasn't upset enough or something. How old were you? I was like nine. Okay. And, so, and I, I honestly didn't... I, all I remember about that is I didn't really have any feelings about it. There was a disconnect. There was yeah, a Yeah, and, and, and you know, some, and that was the point when I definitely, I think, really literally disconnected from myself somehow. I, I found this coping, coping mechanism, which was fantasy. Sure. And and uh, I stayed there for a little while, and then my real father showed up when I was about eleven. I came from school one afternoon, and my real father was sitting. And now my mother had had a few boyfriends in between, or kind of, you know, whatever. And so this guy was sitting in the kitchen, and um, my mother said, "You know, this is." And I said, "No." And she said, "This is Len, and he's your father." And I was, that, that was just, it. Just blew my mind. Like, so wait a minute. All that stuff? Who'd you know, we bury? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Who did? Who is that dude? Good. You know, uh, so... That's yeah, such so, a head trip for an 11-year-old. Yeah. I, lost a father to feel disconnected yeah. Yeah. and to hear... By yeah, the I mean, and there's lots of... And what do you do? Were you like, hey, nice to meet you, Dad? No, not I'm really. 11. I was a little bit... I mean, first of all, I was kind of... He, he was this, like, he was a big guy... And he had like jet black hair. I remember that, and it sort of swept back. And he had a lot of tattoos, and all these gaudy rings, just very much like me, <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> like like cheap gold jewelry, like mar- what we used to call market boy jewelry. And um, I thought, yeah, it probably is my dad, <laughs> you know. But um, he 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 came back a couple of times and and took me and my sister out, and and you know, and I think it was explained to me at that point then that. The, the reason why I wasn't told was I was too young and we didn't... He was out of the picture. My real father, who just lived 30 minutes away, um, was out of the picture because at that time, it just... Dis- we didn't want to be a family where this guy kept showing up and... It was, like, scandalous. Yeah, yeah. but, I mean, it was... like did, My mum did it to as well. She felt that like she was protecting me, but I was the type of kid... I needed to know stuff. You know, I needed to be told... I remember once hearing my mum say to a neighbour across the across the fence, like, you know, David needs a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> you know, out of all the kids. Oh. And I, I felt, I remember thinking, what does that mean? You oh. know? Um, do, you, do you think that's true? I think it's In- kind of true, and I used it to my advantage by joining a band. Right. And, oh. uh, you know... And 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 get being liked by people and uh, that that know. never goes. I like yeah, I, that I know, I know. I uh, know. It's kind of it is very. It, it's it's a real cliche, really, all of it. But um, I, and the truth is, I I kind of had a lot of mates that grew up like that as well. It was it was sort of we we grew up on like council estates in Essex, and it was you know I, it was very difficult for my mom. I. You know, I think she had a really hard time raising four kids. Oh, my God, of course. Oh, she had a couple of jobs. Everything we had was rented. You know, it was like it, sometimes the carpet disappeared. You know, the rug in the in the living room would be like, oh, because it, it wasn't paid for or something. Right. Like, the television, everything we had was rented. Um, and uh, But my mother, like, re- really took good care of us. I mean, she... She she really did. She did the best she, she, that she could. But, I mean, amazing. Like, when I think about it now, how hard it is, you know, it's just that's the hardest job in the world for a mother to raise children. It's just the hardest job in the world. And also <laughs> and also reading that um, <laughs> that you loved getting in trouble. Like, legitimately I did. I, did. I, I sought it. I sought it out. I really... I, 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 I gravitated to any little gang of guys that looked like they were trouble. And I wasn't really a bad kid, but I got into a lot of trouble. 
I, I, by the time I was 15, I'd been in attendance centre. I'd um, been up in juvenile court like three or four times for vandalism, driving and taking away, uh, more vandalism. Um, it, it was pretty easy, though, where I lived to get arrested. Um, you know, it was like, you know, you didn't have to do much, really. Um, and like I said, you know, it'd be the kind of, it's the kind of town that, like, if I was walking down a street with a couple of my mates, like a, a cop car would roll up on you and the window would go down and go, where are you going, David? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was that First kind of... Basis you know, like, yeah, where, where are you going? I'm just going home. It's, did you uh, guys take a car from... So No? Well, it has your fingerprints all over it. You know, it was that kind of thing. Or, or my mother would... This is what I'd hear as well. There'd be a knock at the door. Or my mum would come in the living room and she, I'd be watching TV and she'd be like, did you get in trouble? Did you do something? And I was to be like, uh, why? She said, well, there's a police car just pulled up outside. And I said, yeah, I did. And she said, who with? And I'd say, so-and-so, a couple of my mates. We stole a car on the way home from school. <laughs> OK. And then my mum would, my mum would, like, go to the front Just door when it was... Uh, this was a policeman, hello, is uh, David home? Uh, you know, and she'd be like, well, yes, why? And she'd be, well, we need to talk to him about... It. Well, he, he's been here for... She'd just lie. <laughs> oh, that's she, so would, sweet. She, she would just lie, and I'd hear her lying, and then, uh, you know, she'd finally give in, and... Yeah, so that ended... To be honest, all that stuff ended for me because of music, really. Um, I realised it was going nowhere. I wasn't that stupid. Some of my friends were getting in, like, some... They, they, they'd stepped it up a bit. Right. You know, they were, like, going to rob the post office or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was, you know, it was like... There was only one little post office in town, and, like, a banaclava over the head was not going to... You, you're like, you guys already know us by yeah, our names. Yeah, you go in there, it'd be like, it'd be like Mrs. Jones this. from next door. She'd be like, David, just go. <laughs> who is this David yeah. person? Yeah. No, I don't know I, who you're talking about. I'm yeah. Devin. It, it was a bit like that. <laughs> I was like, um, so I kind of was lucky. I, I kind of got found a group of friends that were going up to the east end of London and, and were going to see some bands and... Bands like Susie and the Band, She's in the Damned, and Nine Nine Nine, nine and uh, all these, you know, um, the Clash, and uh, and they were playing all these little clubs, pubs and clubs, Hope and Anchor, and Music Machine, and um, you know all these kind of places, the ele uh, Electric Ballroom, and um, and so I tagged, tagged along with them, and um, when I first saw Dave Vanium up there on stage, that was like. I'm going to do that, you know. Oh God, it was it. like, uh, it wasn't anything about the way he was singing or the music really. Oh, I, I, I love The Damned. I mean, it was my first real love, but uh, I was a member of the fan club. They sent me a rubber bat. Oh, um, and I, and, um, but when I, I'd watched Dave Vanium, like, stalk in the stage, and um, I was like, I, I can do that. <laughs> I, could, I think I can play. Did you know you could sing though? Yeah. Not, re not really. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I, ha I, I was, I was from a very young age singing along to Bowie and stuff. You know, I was, you know, my mum's broom in the, in the, in, the, in her bedroom, like in her long mirror. You know, I was that kid, definitely pretending to be someone else from a very young age. Sure. And um, yeah, when I when I got the. Uh, when I got the memo that I could actually do it and blag my way into sort of bands, um, when they asked, can you sing? I'd, of course, would be, yeah. I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was in a bunch of different bands uh, that amounted to nothing. The Vermin. Um, Great name, though. Yeah, The Spurts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Great names. <laughs> um, and... Um, they didn't really amount to anything. And then uh, eventually it sort of led to this... Uh, oh, there was a, a bad, terrible band called The French Look that were kind of sort of a bit sort of uh, ultra early ultra-voxy, right. very early ultra-voxy. Um, and I wasn't really singing or anything. I was just really humping their gear around for them and stuff. <laughs> but um, the guy, there was a guy in the, in the band that wanted me to sing in the band and... And it just so happened one day we were rehearsing his schoolroom and next door, in the schoolroom next door, was Vince Clark and Martin Gore and Andrew Fletcher and they were called Composition of Sound. And we, in the room next door, were doing a cover version of Heroes by David Bowie. And they, Vince overheard it. And so somehow he 
got hold of me. There was no cell phones or anything like that. So, you know, a couple of weeks later. Oi, and, David! Yeah. It was something like that over the garden fence. You know, <laughs> was that you singing Heroes? <laughs> and it was a bit like that. And I was, yeah, it was me. Um, we'll be in a band. Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty much that. And so he sa- I said, you got any gigs? He lied. He said they had. I think they had, like, a school gig or something. Um, so that was, I'm thinking, 19, end of 1979, 80, something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's when, because I'll watch a lot of, um, I'll watch a lot of, like, I'll go down these YouTube rabbit holes of, like, old. Mm. It's mm-hmm. like you're watching. I, I do the same thing. Do the same thing. thing. It's <laughs> like, oh, look at the Talking Heads in 1976. Mm-hmm. Or, or, like, Susie and the Banshees, and you see. Yeah. And they're so. I love the Banshees. The yeah. Ba- yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And, but they all start, it's, it's, when you're watching the videos, you're like, Oh, you can't really hear. You can't really make anything out. It's just loud and a lot of shouting. It but was. It was bad. I'm sure it was. <laughs> but it, I'm sure it was bad, just as we were as well. But but then it, it was, starts to form somehow. Yeah, it, yeah. But I think even when it's bad for me, it's so important because yeah. when it's bad, it gives you a I can do that too. That, like that when you was, watched the damn, I'm sure they weren't look, that good. But you were like, I no, can do that right. too. That's absolutely right. I mean, in 1978, I sneaked into the back of Earl's Call. Where Bowie was playing, and with a couple of my mates, we promptly got thrown out. But I got caught enough of it to see. But that was just oh, it was cool. It was like this huge arena, uh, which I think probably only held like maybe eight thousand people. But it was massive. You know, I'd never. Um, and there was Bowie was like just something else to me, um, out of this world, uh, but gave me everything I needed at a very young age. To the, I felt like that alien that he sang about. Right. And so he was, you know, that was my first love, but um, um, his music. Um, but, yeah, seeing Dave Vanium, seeing... Um, I mean, Susie Sue was, like, scary. She was, yeah. She was just like, oh, my God. It was just... She just was everything that this young man wanted. (laughs) You know, she was awesome and so powerful and, you know, uh, really intimidating. If if you locked eyes with her, oh, boy, you could... It's just, you know... Oh, my God. Darting all over the place, but she could just destroy you with her eyes. Um, But I was lucky I got to see all these bands. I mean, because... Quite often in those days, like 78, 77, 78, there would be like three or four of these bands on the same bill. It would be like, you know, 999, Susie and the Banshees and the Damned, you know, you know, uh, The Clash and, you know, Susie and the Banshees. Like, it was just in, because then there was always somewhere to go. So I ended up like around that time as well. There was a squat in King's Cross in London. There was a lot of squats and it was full of punks. Um, and it was, they took over this whole building, and it was right around the corner of the Music Machine. Um, so I used to spend a lot of time up there. For it seemed like a long time, but it was probably just six months. You know? <laughs> what was the oh energy God, in so it? Like jealous. when you're going to see Susan the Banshee yeah. and the Damned? Like, what is the venue size? What is the energy in the mm. room? Does it feel like oh, this is this is something special, or did it just feel like something really cool to do? No, it was totally. <clears throat> It was like the thing to do for me. It was a part of a gang. I hung out with all these other punks. Um, Did you guys feel like you were on the ground floor of something that's like yeah, this is going to be important? Know it. You didn't know it. At the, you know, too young to know. I mean, I was like fifteen. Oh, 16, gotcha. You know, but but I but I definitely was part of something that you know nobody else understood. Right. Um, and we were like hunted down by people at that time as well. Like if you. If you had different color hair and you were a guy and I had like, you know, I had purple hair, I had orange hair, I had white hair, you know, you chased home literally from like get off the train and the yobs would see you. You were literally chased, chased all the way home. If they caught you, you'd get quite a beating just for the way you look because you look so different. I mean, when I think about it today, it's it's crazy. But um, yeah, it was like you were a threat to normality sure you know earring in my nose uh, the fact that some people organized enough yeah to go up because yeah you know it was a movement it was a movement but it was small and it didn't last long really you know a lot grew from that but it really i mean it it shone really brightly for uh, at the most two years (laughs) 
Oh, my gosh. You know, and then it suddenly... But then it, I was lucky, see, because then I got into... I got, I got lucky enough to join this band. You know, I was 18... Um, I was at art college, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, as all dropouts do. I left school at 15. I was I was asked to leave school, uh, more or less, uh, Easter. That's very British. We were yeah. asked to leave yeah, school. I was asked, like, exactly. basically, the deputy headmaster, you know, gone. We wouldn't mind if you didn't come back <laughs> after. Like, you know, we wouldn't mind. I'd be like, I was like, all right, Ed. <laughs> it would be very polite. Yeah, yeah. We, wouldn't we, wouldn't, we wouldn't miss you if you didn't come back. <laughs> it was something like that. And I was like, well, I ain't coming back. <laughs> Fine, we could Fine. use the space. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Good. Off you go, then. More lunches for yes. everyone else. Good luck out there, <laughs> you loser. Well, that's... You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so you... When... Depeche Mode became one of the biggest bands in the history of music. Did all were all those people like I always knew, yeah, boy, right. that they Dave, he always. No, yeah. no, definitely not. In fact, I went back to Mr. Allen, you know, years <laughs> later, and told him I went back to the school, and and I said, Mr. Allen, you know, I knocked on the deputy heads, and he, and I was I was probably nineteen, twenty, and you know, made a few few quid. Uh, done it. Maybe bought my first like Escort XR3i or something. Oh, nice! Yeah, you know, like pulled into the school next to his little two Renault two CV, uh, you know, and totally. his, his teacher car, and uh, told him, "I was like, remember when you said I would amount to nothing?" I said, "Well, I, I, I'm something. Like I was on top of the pops." You know? like, you <laughs> but know. he must have known that because there um, were only like three shows. I don't know, but it was I. I got immense satisfaction out of doing that. I think he. I mean, look, I was at school when corporal punishment still existed, so this guy caned me so many times. Oh, my God. I mean, whipped me, you know, literally. Like, you get six of the best. Go to his office, you know, bend over the, the desk, literally, and, you know, that, like you see in these old films, that's what we got. Did some of the... <clears throat> Did some of the undercurrent of S and M come from that? I think he definitely enjoyed it. That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, in, I mean, in we your... enjoyed pretending it didn't hurt. I mean, I mean, my, my friend and I, Mark, who would often end up at, uh, in the office, um, we would do our utmost to just give him a look like that's that's, that's all you got. Yeah, like I don't. Even... <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. And then you'd go into the bathroom, into the toilet, and literally pull down your. And there'd be like bloody wheels. Oh my god! It was brutal. I mean, and the the worst one though was a, a wooden ruler across the knuckles. Oh Jesus! Yes. Like when they hold out your hand and just whack it across. So it was a little while after I left school that then that was outruled. I think, and in England it was like, which is too bad because you realize how well it worked. <laughs> my mother used to hundred million like, albums well, worldwide. <laughs> don't lie, Dave. It certainly made. He whipped you into shape. My, I used to go home and say, "Mom, you know, Mister, I, really, I didn't really." Do it. She said, "Well, you probably deserved it." <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was that's what I got from my mom. But, um... but I remember being in high school, and I went to I went to all boys Catholic school, and there was this guy who would tour. This was probably eighty seven. There was a, a guy who would tour around all the like the the Catholic schools, I guess. And he had a list of songs called The Dirty Dozen. Oh, nice. Do you know what that, do you remember that at all? Do you remember what that was? I mean, it sounds vaguely it was basically familiar. Like, it was like, These are songs that are negatively influencing yes. your kids. Yes. And all the songs were fucking great, by the <laughs> yeah, way. I feel like it was, was just. a list of my favorite yeah. songs. Yeah. I, I was like, why are they, they're just yeah. advertising yeah. great songs right. to, to kids. But there was a Depeche Mode song on there. Uh, yeah, it was probably like Master, Master and Servant. Servant. Yeah. yeah. It was we Master got a lot of stick for that song. It was, I, I, we didn't really get it. I mean, the video was pretty. You know, masochistic, I guess. We were all kind of chained up and being, like, pulled around. We did the video in Berlin, I remember, and it was pretty bizarre, actually, you know, I think about it. Um, but, you know, that was... we. Yeah, we were odd. We were odd guys. You know, we were all odd, and it was lucky that we found each other. Um, we definitely were weird. Um, you know, we liked Iggy and the Stooges, and we liked... It was, you know, it was stuff that we liked... Martin was a bit more like he was also already heavily influenced by craft work and and he was this but we both had Bowie in common um particularly heroes low station to station but Ziggy Stardust by far was like our I'm sure Martin learned how to play guitar to that album probably 
Are you looking at other bands coming up at the time? Are you looking over at like The Cure or Joy Division? Look at these guys and go, "No, they're doing this, so we yeah, should do this." The Joy, Joy Division for <clears throat> sure. I mean, I recently rebuilt a, a lot of vinyl by Joy Division. <laughs> yep, and I played a couple of albums, as, and I was just like. It's just so heavy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they are shit. so dark. But at the time, I was just, it spoke to me, you know. Of course. Was like, Tortured teenager. Yeah. It was awesome. But now it's just the, the angst, just in Ian Curtis's voice, is, is, it gives me goosebumps. I mean, I, I, must, I, I love that, uh, anything like that. I mean, to, to, to this day, like the, like the my voice that speaks to me the most is probably Mark Lanigan's. You know, it's like, I, you know, I listen because I, I he's a singer. He's a real singer. There's plenty of vocalists out there, but like, there's few singers. Uh, Johnny Cash, like people that you listen to Bowie, like where you believe them. Billy Holiday, like they're that, that's what I that's what I gravitate to. If I believe the singer. I'm all in. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm all, I'm all in. So, but it's amazing that you were Ian able Kurt to well, yeah. navigate the, because it would have been very easy to just have been an '80s band. But yeah. then, when I went, when I was in college, I remember we played um, in my my roommates and I. I don't know for whatever reason we had a ritual every morning. We would play "World in My Eyes" like in the in the first thing in the morning, like to get everyone up. Yeah, just that. And yeah, I would always hear it that, <laughs> and, I, and I would know it was time to yeah. to wake up. And every morning that song, like, so you guys, you were able to tr- basically be timeless. And so, how do you? I mean, I, maybe this is an impossible question to answer. How do you do that? How do you? Keep- well, we never wanted to. We, we we didn't fit in with a lot of the groups that sort of came out the same time as us. We definitely felt like we had much more in common with the Cure than say at the time like Duran Duran or whatever, right. you know the other bands that were were having great success to be honest at that time we kind of we we were having success but we weren't like we definitely weren't mainstream not even in England in fact the more we kind of were pushed in that direction the weirder we got <laughs> <laughs> and i don't know if that was something i remember there was one point about 1986 when a radio plugger for, that we used at the time came and listened to some stuff we were doing. I think we were recording at the time Black Celebration. So we had maybe recorded Stripped. Um, you know, I don't know. Anyway, we played him a couple of songs and his face was just like, I- I'm never going to get this on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just like, yes. Like, we, we, it kind of, we enjoyed that uh that 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 we were not it was going to be a struggle. I mean, he managed to somehow get us on the radio a bit, but um, we definitely were heading in a different direction. We were performing more. Um, we certainly were a band that was we were touring a lot in Europe, and uh, we'd been to the states a few times, and we realised that we were creating like a cult following. Right, that was way more important to us than being on the radio. Right. It re- it really was. There was pressure for us to be on the radio because, you know, we'd signed a record deal over here with Sire Records, Warner Brothers, and they just did not get us at all. We'd come to the end of a tour when we had played to maybe 300,000 people in America, and the record company would be like, why have we only sold 100,000 albums? Like, we'd be at this board meeting up at Warner Brothers there in Burbank, wherever it was. Right. And we'd sitting around and be all like, uh, Howie? Uh, Lenny? Uh, <laughs> and we'd just be like, wait, you played to 300,000 people? Why aren't we selling more records? That wouldn't be the question we'd be asking. We kind of already had this idea that we were doing something on our own with it, with that was more important somehow. And that's how you stayed in purpose. Yeah, I, 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 think, the... I think so. I think, and then we had some moments later on where we had some great radio success just by accident, I think. I think it was just right place, right time. Was that Personal, personal Jesus? Jesus, yeah. You know, yeah. Joy to Silence, Policy of Truth. There were certain songs that were still, to be honest, quite weird. <laughs> and, uh, but, and then Songs of Faith and Devotion, we purposely sort of went in to make an album that was nothing like Violator. You know, we wanted to. Um, I mean, Flood, who was produced produced by later, uh, and it had been incredibly successful all over the world. 
um, back in the days when you sold a lot of records, I think that album sold you know some 12 million copies or something around the world, maybe more than that. I don't know. Um, but we wanted to go when we, were, we go back into the studio. We we did not want to make Violator Two. Of course, there was a lot of pressure to do that. Of course, um, but we just knew that it was not the right move. And this is not something that Depeche Mode. We we don't sit around having talks about this stuff. Um, I think that we're still pretty odd. We're pretty indifferent, and that's kind of what makes it interesting. When we go in the studio, it's still weird. We don't. We don't all, hey guys, what's up? Let's let's rock and roll, you know. <laughs> it's just not. It's, we, it's it's weird and it's dark and it's sometimes heavy and um. Just, and then we make this music that comes out of that. But I think that's that <clears throat> that's the the perfect answer because if you're if you're driven by the money or if you're driven by the fame or any of the success part, then once you get that, then I, f- I feel like people go, well, now now what do we do? Well, that's, we, yeah. And we had those moments, definitely. I definitely personally had those moments. Like, when I moved out here to L.A. and, you know, we just reached a point of, like, what do we do? We, we played that, the Rose Bowl and, you know, where do we, what do we do now? Like, what do we do now? So I just dove into debauchery, you know, um, and found that that was very – it was a, a big cliche, but at the same time it was so like somewhere I needed to go because, I don't know, I didn't I – didn't, I wanted to sort of destroy what was happening somehow. Because it was too good or you I didn't think, feel like you deserved I, I, it? I think I, a bit of both. I think uh, I, I wanted to just experience that. And at the same time, and once I was really experiencing that, I, d- I didn't know how to get out. Yeah. It, it was impossible. It's kind almost, of interesting. It's it almost was like, impossible to get out. It's almost like you were... It was <laughs> the hardest thing I ever did. Vandalizing yourself. Yeah, I, what I was. I'm very much into self-inflicted pain. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, and, I, and I've sort of... I'm, I'm just... The, the difference today is like, I'm very aware of that, that I can go to really dark spaces and I kind of catch myself. Like, I mean, this happens on a, a daily basis. You know? it's, not, it's not like, you know, I can be in the greatest of moods and then just sink into oblivion. And it's, the, I, you, you know, it's just the way I am. Um, I'm, I'm also very aware of the fact that I'm incredibly fortunate to have the choice and the option to, to choose, like, what I do, where I go, who I work with, um, it still blows my mind. I'm still that, a part of me is still that kid from Essex. Kind of just blag my way into anything and then get out of it, you know. Um, so. How did you I, get out of it? Because there were yeah. so many, <clears throat> just to read the accounts, it's like there were so many times where I was like, how's he going to get out of that? Oh, he survived. Yeah. Um, I, I was lucky I had a lot of hostages. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Emotional um, hostages. Yeah, the, there was a lot of people around me that it was, it was in their best interest, first of all, to keep me alive. Sure. And then secondly, I'm just... Uh, there's just something bigger. That's all I can say. It's like a, a bigger thing that somehow pulls me out of these terrible <laughs> choices I get myself into sometimes. Um, I'm just that kind of person. I'm drawn, you know, and I'm drawn to that kind of comedy. I'm, you know, I, I'm drawn to, you know, the Louis C.K.'s, the Bill Burr's, yeah. the, you know, Mark Maron's, the, yeah. you know, um, and I love comedy, I, movies, music, whatever. It's I'm drawn to the stuff that, you know, takes you to those places. Yeah, when I met you at K Rock and you go, Oh, hey, I know your show at midnight. I was like, You do? Yeah, exactly. How do you know that? Dude, I'm going to rat out Hardwick too because he texted me and was like, Um, Dave Gahan knows who I am. Yeah, I feel, <laughs> I feel his pain. You know, I, and, you know, and I think that's part of what, uh, you know, mine and I over the years with Depression as well. It's like we, you know, we do, that, and the people that are drawn to our music and, and what we do, it's like we're all a little odd. Sure. And there was at times when it's like you didn't have a gang to be odd with, 
And uh, so we created this huge gang, which is, you know, the following of Depeche Mode. You well, know? yeah. Can I ask some dorky sure. questions really yeah. fast? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Only because when we were talking about earlier, first of all, because 1979 to me is the greatest year of music, period. And I'm so fascinated. I've read so many books about that two-year period you're talking about where it only lasted that long where you're right. hanging out watching Susie and the Banshees, but everything cool yeah. came from that. There was, yeah, coming, I mean, it went into The Cure and Echo and the Bunny Man, and like there was there were these sort of bands that and, and Joy Division and, you know, I feel very fortunate that, uh, you know, I had that. I, I had that experience and I was part of that. And... Um, well, that's what I was curious about is you because you mentioned the cure and stuff like do you see them and even especially at the time as rivals or were you like, I like them oh, and no, we want to definitely not rivals. I mean, I'm always curious as to all the yeah. bands I like if they see everyone else's competition or if you like listen to we, cure. We records. would follow it. We, we, I mean, I would, you know, violate it. Then there's disintegration. There was like right. certain record and it was like you could I couldn't wait for the next record kind of thing to see what they were going to and when they put out disintegration it was more like wow this is so good. You know really? it was like, Yeah definitely it was so good. I mean it was just so dark and so gothic and so good. Um and so no I, I definitely admired that stuff more. Um and then and then really around that time that's when I I would, I went back to, I listened to a lot of Bowie, and I still do, uh-huh. um, Low and Station to Station and Heroes and those those records in particular, Joy, Joy Division, and um, I, I was not listening to anything that was on the radio. Well, I think that you guys <laughs> kind of invented, it's like Chris was saying, being timeless, I feel like you guys were always ahead of the curve because like... Okay, my two favorite genres of music are post-punk and when people were first figuring out how to use synthesizers. And I think you guys are on the cusp of that. We were definitely trying to figure it out. Totally. The only reason, the reason really we first used synthesizers more than traditional instrument, instruments. I mean, Fletch played bass originally. I, I, used to, I used to work the little drum machine. I think Vince played some guitar and he had a, he had a synthesizer. And Martin had a synthesizer. Um, and the reason was we they were more interesting. You could create more interesting right. sounds, and we weren't great musicians, <laughs> so you couldn't pl- you know we couldn't make these other instruments interesting. Um, and I think the uh, the electronics kind of gave us that edge to explore, um, and and we were still writing in very traditional sort of pop music right way. you know it was still a, it's the same as the cure and all these bands. it was a, it was in a certain way but you had to have a sound one thing i can say for all those bands at that time whether it was the bunny men or it was the cure or it was us or, or whatever that we were all really different like you, you couldn't really like we were you could group, group us in that you could play us on the radio side by side but but every band really had their own identity I can't when I when I listen to radio now. If I'm just going to like everything seems to just like, right. maybe I'm just like this old fart like, and I I don't you know but I I can't. The only thing I really gravitate to is a lot of like rap music. To be honest, like a lot of stuff that I find is really. I mean some some stuff like but I mean of course not all of it same as anything anything else but rhythmically and um, in a punky way, it's like. It's like uh, modern blues or something. Or fucking with... I mean, it's, like, it's just that idea of, like, fucking with whatever the system yeah. is. I, I think so. I think there's something about it that I find is really ballsy and... Uh... Well, also with rap, it's so much of it hinges on the personality and the mm-hmm. story of whoever the the lead guy, like, whoever... If it's just one guy... Yeah, there's it's real like, character. It's his story. It's yeah. his... You know, it is. It is. Yeah. It, it's it's character and story, and, yeah. and you know, if, if he's telling an authentic story, then like you said, you know when someone well, means it. But that happened. I was, I, I guess that happened in New York, and and you know, there was all this mainstream disco, and then all of a sudden, in the in the the sub in the in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and these places, there was these underground parties going on where people were like scratching and doing things that were interesting with, with with. Disco records, right? And but breaking them up and making break beats and doing stuff and creating like you, you know human drum machines. So I think for us it was always more interesting to work with uh, like electronics like that and and mix it up with stuff, but also to find people to work with that were really interested in that too. That were interested in um, 
that were new, innovative, that weren't necessarily conditioned to the traditional forms of recording. We were lucky to find people who who found us, mostly through Daniel Miller from Mute Records, who introduced us to these different engineers and different producers that were not the norm, and they would find interesting ways... I mean, the first thing we would go when we went into a recording studio was we'd go in the kitchen to see what things we could bash and throw down the stairs. And, <laughs> totally. and, 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 and you know, <laughs> that the made noises that were interesting. Then in those days, you, you as well, you had to record on a, on a, 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 a tape machine. Uh, you'd record something that was just, you know, th- throwing a bunch of pots and pans down the stairs. You know, for instance, set up a couple of mics and, you, and you'd record these things and then loop that piece of tape and create which became the beginning of, say, Blasphemous Rumours. You know, it was just a bunch of pots and pans falling down the stairs, but suddenly there's a sound that nobody had heard before. I don't even know if we were that aware of what we were doing, but we were... We were a bit wacky, you know. Yes. Um, we, yeah, you know. But that's the most appealing part yeah. of it to me because I feel yeah. like at that time it was like you guys and Human League and like yeah. maybe New Order. Let's not forget Human like League. They were really, inventing yeah. a genre. Yeah, New Order. I mean, definitely there was. Yeah, and we were all very different. Um, but I like that it's sort of you're listening, going, these dudes are figuring it out as they, it's still amazing, no, totally. but it's like, we, we still, we, you can we, tell the enthusiasm. You guys that. are like, let's figure out what sounds. <laughs> yeah, this we, makes. We're still that. Yeah. I mean, um, in rehearsals, in the studio, everything is still trying to discover. We've, I mean, we've got better at it, um, but we, it's still about trying to discover a way to um, make the music interesting sonically. And uh, that's the as a listener, yeah. like that's the most exciting thing to me. Well, that's that, the authenticity that I I'm like, oh yeah, these guys are excited to make new stuff. Well, I think it says a lot. I think when you can tell when a band covers something, like where their hearts are at, mm-hmm. because sometimes it's like you mentioned Echo and the Bunnymen, they cover People Are Strange, but it was basically just like, well, you just covered it like the door. You just basically yeah. did a karaoke uh, yeah, version. Right. I mean, yeah. like. It was just them going, I wonder if we could sound exactly, exactly. like yours. Yeah. But then you guys cover Route 66, and yeah. it's just... And now, yeah. I think a lot of people now probably don't even remember what the original right. sounds like, because no. that, is, that was such a fucking enormous hit song. Yeah, which, which was totally... We, we used to do these things, and it was by accident, really. I think it was the B-side of Behind the Wheel, uh, which was from that album, and, and I think over here they flipped flipped it over on the radio and started playing Roots, that version of Route 66, which was to us was like a real throwaway thing that we had <laughs> recorded probably in a couple of hours and threw it down because we needed a B-side, you know. Right. Um, but it became, I mean, we did it live and it became part of that Music for the Masses show. It was a big part of that show. But. I mean, it's... How do you? Dis- I don't think we were even aware that much of the, it was a cover, <laughs> <laughs> you know, of or of the original version. But we were trying to work out the chords or something that sounded similar, um, and then get a beat going. It was about getting a beat going in the studio, and that's what really what I was en- identifying with a lot of the rap stuff, because it's about a beat. And back then, it was really for us about finding a really interesting rhythm track, a beat. Make, made up of noises that n- weren't necessarily that tuneful. Um, in fact, you know, quite often on some of those albums that we did, the sounds are pretty kind of like what? <laughs> like they they kind of. But that's I love that. Yeah, you know I love think, it. what's yeah, great about yeah. it too is that is talking to you and understanding some of your struggles and hearing about the music. It's the same. It's a reflection of what your life has been which is essentially figuring out how to contain and control the chaos yeah and i'm still i'm still doing that like i said the, you know the the beast you know as, as it gets you know i can tame it a little but it's it's definitely just just it's in me it's part it's there i can i have a great uh talent in being able to destroy <laughs> <laughs> and um you know and i try that's the way i perform on stage as well i i don't I, I treat the stage with a lot of disdain. I don't, I, and I enjoy that. I, it's it's this why why is this happening? You know, it's like I, I and I have a lot of fun with it. I kind of my tongue is kind of firmly planted in my cheek, but at the same time, I really go there with the songs. Like the songs, and now when we've been rehearsing for this tour, 
um, they, they, they span such a long period of time. Different songs like In Your Room or Walking In My Shoes, or they represent a real period in my life. And I, I really go back there. It's like I, it all comes flooding back in that three or four minutes, uh, like certain scenes and scenarios, you know. I don't know, just... I Is mean, there anything you guys don't want to play or that you would just refuse to... Um, there's a few songs. I mean, um, Martin particularly hates People Are People. which was hate that song. Yeah, right, which totally. was a big hit and would fit quite nicely into the, into into the scheme of things. Oh, my God, like, can I please... How weird know. was it that you guys had to be like, oh, we're not a white power band? Yeah, when that oh, my guy, God, yeah. How weird did you what, ever think uh, you were going to have to say that? <laughs> I have had to answer so many questions about that in weird ways, but um, well, I just remember it was just so ridiculous. It's so remember when yeah. Johnny Marr told David yeah. Cameron he was like, "You're not allowed to like the Smiths." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it reminded me of that where it's like, "Dude, you're not allowed to like." Someone us. actually commented on that. Someone said something. I drew that analogy. I thought it was a really good analogy, but it was absolutely true. It's like, have you listened to our music? Yes. Like everything about it is like. Just the opposite of what you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. Well, that's what's um, so. I mean, you know, when you, as you're developing, I mean, the only analogy I have is comedy. And when I think, like, oh, I'm going to perform jokes I did 20 years ago, I shudder and I go, those were terrible. I couldn't. That's, so- that's what there's certain songs you can, like, on the last tour, we threw Just Can't Get Enough in there again. And as an encore, and in a certain place after a certain bunch of songs have been done, you can come on stage again and then have some fun with that and, and kind of go there. But it has to really fit. You, you know, you've got to do it with, with guts. So you can't, you know, you've you got to have fun with it. So there's certain things that you just can't. You try them and they don't quite work. Um, so, yeah, it's the same, I would, I would imagine, of, like, old jokes or things that you did. There's certain things that you hear now, and you're just like, what? <laughs> it's, like, it's even, like, my voice, like, on certain things. When I was, like, you know, 10 years old or whatever, however young it was, I was, I sound like that. And to me, I'm like, oh, God, I can't, I can't sing that melody. Um, it doesn't, doesn't work for me anymore. But you have a – is there anything that you look back on now and you go, oh, I have a fresh perspective on this old thing – and now it means something different, and so it has this renewed meaning. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've been rehearsing a few songs this time that we haven't done for a lot of years, and there's certain ones, Everything Counts, for instance. Um, it fits right in now, and it fits right in with everything, all the uh, other songs that are on this new record spirit. So, um, you know, yeah, it's... I'm sorry, I just I got really distracted by your wallpaper. By the amazing yeah, Star Wars yes. wallpaper? I was, yeah. The fuzzy I, Star Wars I wallpaper. I just completely zoned out. I was like, oh, it's so cool. It's so hypnotic. <laughs> it's, and it's fuzzy. You can, you can rub on oh, it. Oh, well, I will do too. that before I leave. Yeah, you can definitely rub the <laughs> wallpaper. But I, but I also... <clears throat> what is the feeling like... So you, you go on stage and you, you, know, you play for, I don't know, probably couple a hours, couple yeah. hours. Yeah. And you're taking, and you're really kind of living through all these emotional periods yeah. for all these songs. And there's, you know, 50,000 people or however many people it is. And then you walk backstage and it's just like, now, yeah, now, it's, now, it's, now what happens? It's a bit like that, although I, I, I tend to disappear. I just, uh, I, I get out of there as quick as possible and get to a room where I can just sit and stare at the wall for four hours. You know, that's kind of my, what I do. I just, <laughs> um, I feel so in the thing that I can't really I can't really talk about it afterwards. Really. Right. It's just and I do go through such such a gambit of emotions that I just literally am done. I go I get in a van, I go back to the hotel, you know, sit in an, an ice bath you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and just try and get the feeling back in my legs. Um Nowadays, um, and that's pretty much that's pretty much it. You know, order a room service and stare at the wall, um, eating French fries. But um, those, uh, you know, I don't even know how I had the energy all those years of what we used to get up to after the show. Right. I mean, the show was just like this little part of it, and then the whole evening just went into the next morning, wherever that was, every night, everywhere. 
for many, many years. Well, you're Wolverine when you're younger. I mean, <laughs> yes. you, can, you can just sort of be like, yeah, dust off and go, okay. You, you pull into McDonald's or whatever after yeah. it's in the bus and then uh, <laughs> happy meal and good to go. <laughs> yeah. um, that doesn't work anymore. No, but, now uh, you have to worry about things like cholesterol. Oh, my God. It's just, just being able to walk. <laughs> well, is, it's, you know, like uh, to be able to be a band for a yeah. few decades and still be able to do a full show requires a lot. It I mean, does. It's it like does. it's work. I know. It's... I enjoy that. You know, I, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the challenge of that. Um, and there's nothing quite like it. Um, can't explain it. It's the weirdest thing. Um, those, those couple of hours on stage are the only part of it that makes any sense whatsoever. The rest of it, the traveling, uh, you know, the, all, it's for those two hours. I, mean, I think Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stones said it best once. He said, you know, when he was asked about what it was like being in the Stones for 30 years, he said, well, five years of work and 25 years of waiting. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You're always just I was waiting. Like, that is awesome. You're on a bus, that's, or you're on a plane, or you're waiting you're, to go and on then stage. You do your thing for a couple of hours on stage. I mean, it's interesting that because earlier you sort of hinted at like, listen, I know appreciate. I know I'm very lucky. I can do what you know. I have. I have all these options, and I and I do think it's. For and most, I do. I really. I really. Today, I, I, I'm, I feel fortunate that I am. Very appreciative of that. Um, I, 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 you know, I literally thank things all day long. Yeah. I, I, because I, I went through many, many years not doing that. Not because I wasn't appreciative, but just, uh, I just was on full steam go to try and get somewhere. I don't know. You don't know where? I don't know where that is. Were you running to or or away from? Uh, Bit of both. Bit of both. Um, definitely trying to prove something. Did you ever prove it? Um, I think uh, to other people and then finding that that didn't really satisfy the need <laughs> at all. Um, and then over the last, like, I would say, 10 years, kind of just feeling like, wow, I kind of, I did all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it, well yeah. I think you're pretty yeah. cool, so I don't yeah. know if that helps. I did all right. And, like, uh, my I think I solved like your problem. Me, you know, yeah. my wife likes me. Um, I, that, that I don't quite... That's still like a bit weird for me. Uh, the self-loathing is still there. If I want to go there, well, um, yeah, but that's what some people go. What do you got to worry about? You got all the money in the I world, know, and then you I go. Get that I know, I but know. you have to understand that <laughs> the reason people become artists is because they suffer in some way, mostly, and that's defensive armor. So they either become comedians or musicians because they're yeah. trying to understand themselves. What I really identify with comedians, I, I, it's the ones that the, the you know I sort of grew up with. As well, because that that self loathing and that that kind of, but then been able to that genius have been able to turn that into comedy. I mean, I've been in like shows. I mean, I've been sitting in shows with comedians where I, I like, or a movie where I burst out laughing and it's it's someone just like killed themselves or something. <laughs> you know, and, and, like, and, 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 and everybody else is like, quite, and then I suddenly like. Catch yourself into my chair, you know, yeah. like because I I have this weird sense of humor. Well, the I? darkness never goes yeah. away because it's defense, yeah. it's protective. Yeah, I think so. And so I find that it's like I remember years and years ago I went to this rehab, and this this guy, this counselor, said to me, um, he took me over to this was one of these fancy rehabs, and there was horses, and he took me over to these horses, and he said, I want you to walk into the horses and. Uh, <laughs> This is crazy. What I'm about. This is rehab. the horses, yeah. And uh, one of them's going to pick you. And I was like, <laughs> dude, I, I, I don't think this is a good idea. You know, let <laughs> you know, the horse like, choose like, you. Let the horse choose you. And I was like, oh my god. So I stand there. These horses start sniffing around. I'm not very happy. I'm like sweating. I've just got to this place. I'm like detoxing. It was somewhere in Arizona. I'm like, who put me here? <laughs> you know. Um, and this horse came over to me, and it stomped on my foot, like. And I had these little, like, like com, you know, converse right. shoes on with no socks, you know, kind of no laces or anything. I'm Barely just like, not shoes. Sure. It totally stomped on my foot and and drew blood, you know. And I started laughing. I, I just burst out laughing, and <laughs> the and this counselor looked at me dead straight, and he just deadpan was like, "David, your pain is not funny." <laughs> and I was just like. No, it really is. <laughs> you know, dude, that was... You told me to do that. You know, it was just... I didn't get it at all, but... 
it, it stuck with me that. Like, your pain is not funny. Like, later on, it, uh, maybe five years later, when I was sitting in some hotel room, like, you know, with the crack pipe, like, shaking, I was like, my pain is not funny. <laughs> you know, it was like, it came back to me. You know? But you, but you, I mean, it, it, it is, because you went through a lot of really horrible things. Yeah, well, self, self-inflicted. I got to say, like, I, all that stuff, I'm very lucky to come out the other side of it. A lot of people don't. Um, I was lucky because there was those people putting me in these rehabs and taking care of me and trying, but I was often trying to escape uh, something, mm-hmm. um, and that's where I found myself in those places. That's why drink and drugs was, you know, when it worked, it was it was the the, the answer to everything. I mean, I felt great. I, I loved it. I loved drugs. I loved booze, you know, until it just didn't work anymore right that's the awful moment when you know those years that you spend trying to make it work and it's just not there's no place left to escape to. it was terrifying except for the ultimate escape and then rehabs and stuff like that that was just like not my idea of fun it reminded me of going back to like those places that i was sent to as a kid like attendance center and just juvenile courts and just you know, you've got to get right. But I'm not right. You right. Know, I'm not, probably never will be. And I think the real key to all that stuff is, and I was lucky, was you do have to accept who you are and how you feel. And that it's okay. You, you don't have to medicate. You, don't, you just, you know... Sometimes you feel like shit. You've got to, sometimes you feel like shit. And you've got to find people that also feel like shit. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and you kind of, you know, it's not like you have to wallow in your own pain. But, like, you know, you've got to somehow find a place where you can find it amusing. Comedy help, help, helps me. Always did. Monty Python, whatever it was, it helped me. Well, in, 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 the, in all comedy, there is a seed of something horrible. Yeah. Because it's good comedy. Good comedy. Yeah. Because there's something, it, it's protective and it helps us commune yeah. and it helps us cope. It's got to rub you the wrong way a little bit, too, I think. And so, were you, when you would get to the brink of death and get brought back and come yeah. through it, would you wake up and go, ha 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 ha? Or would you go, ah, shit? But, I did both. But um, uh, most of the time, it was like, I was, I was pretty happy to kind of feel feel good again oh good like just feel like good about myself or good. whatever like healthy or whatever for a bit until the next time but um yeah that was a long process well i'm glad that it i'm glad that you thank you I, because it's <laughs> because you see you such I'm a sweet wonderful guy and thank it was you. it was so wonderful to meet you at k-rock and i you know and I, I don't know if I mentioned to you about coming on the podcast at the time, but of course it was in the back of my head. I think we said that we'd get to get you, – you, I think you might have mentioned it. I think and I might have I, mentioned it. I you know, brought it up. I'm so glad you coming. did. Yeah. So, well, thanks for having me. I am so yeah. <laughs> absolutely pleased and honored. And I had April come on because April is like – if any, I, April knows more about – music than anyone and i know quite a bit but april I'm hardwick's like, coolest friend uh no big deal <laughs> she says yeah. in her gang of four t-shirts <laughs> I mean, whatever guys yeah of course. how long I did like... you spend picking out which t-shirt you were yeah, gonna wear I today um, not that. really that i was like it'd be in bad taste of those shirts, oh, yeah, you? Of it, yeah a whole wardrobe of them yeah I'm but sure. yeah yeah so i was super excited to come hang out for sure and i'm always interested i'm glad to hear you say i swear, this is gonna be the dorkiest thing anyone's ever said but I tend to feel bad. I'm like, I feel bad because you can't listen to Depeche Mode. Like, do you know what I mean? Because like, <laughs> you can't hear it You can't listen way. to your own no, band and I, be like, this yeah, is so great. And it's funny you say that because people, I, I, I never listen to my band. Because, <laughs> I mean, like, because when you, you work on it, you, you do the thing. I mean, I actually only ever listen to a record that we've done before when we're making a new one. Right. And I sort of will reference You can't, like, objectively. You no, know, and I kind of go, wow, it's... We, we we really did we, we did that different, uh, you know. And so yeah, I, and then when once we're performing, that's a whole, that's a, that's so almost like a different band, right? Again, it's like another thing. Uh, but it's cool to me to hear that you don't see other. I always think of my favorite. I'm like, oh, do they see them as rivals or are they like competition? But it's oh, cool no, to think of you being no. like, no, I listen to the. Well, that's also, I don't that's hate also them. how innovation works when you're right. open to. I think there is a healthy form of competition, which is not ever. I must destroy everyone to succeed. It's right. Oh, they're doing that, so we should do this. And oh, wow, right. this is like yeah, that's how was, innovation there was, drives. There was definitely that in the certainly in the eighties with certain certain bands like around that time. 
Um, it just they kind of lifted the bar, and you were like, this is, "We were in with this group. This this is this is our gang, not this other thing that people kind of." And, and I think that was what was odd about us was always that uh, people never could quite put us in like a category. And so we weren't rock and we weren't pop. You were we just Depeche Mode. Totally. We were Depeche Mode, yeah. It was I like, sort of got, I, this is not, yeah. I have never met a single person in my life who didn't like Depeche Mode. And I'm talking about people who like rap, punks, metal dudes, because right. I've worked in a bunch of record stores right. and stuff too. And you guys are like the Tom Hanks of bands. <laughs> right. Where it's like, no one That's doesn't cool. like you. No one that. doesn't like you. Well, I'll that. thank you so much for being here, Dave Gahan. Thanks. And you can come back whenever you want. Spirit is the album, and you're about to do a massive tour. Yes, we are. We are. We, we set off. We're doing some, uh, we're actually doing a little show on Wednesday night um, at the Masonic, Hollywood Forever. Nice. Thing, just no. for an hour, yeah. What? So maybe we can hook you guys up. I mean... Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe. maybe. So. It's, just, it's just like a half show. We're doing like maybe an hour or something like that. But it'd be fun. It's, I think we could be there for... Yeah, I think that would be, be cool. I'll, I'll clear my schedule. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then we're off to Sweden. We're Literally the next day we start in Stockholm next week. Um, and we're doing all these huge stadiums across Europe first, and then we uh, we do North America in the, uh, what uh, we call the fall. All, all the dates are at DepecheMode.com. Yes. You're welcome to come back anytime you want. Spirit is a new album. And uh, thanks for being here yeah, today. Man. It was thanks an absolute pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very Enjoy much. Enjoy your burrito, everyone. Of course. Thank you. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. <laughs> This episode of the Nerdist Podcast was brought to you by Silicon Valley Season 4. Now airing Sundays, 10 p.m. on HBO. Or you can watch on the HBO Go or HBO Now app. Uh, Changes in the air. The Pied Piper guys pursue their video chat app, Piper Chat. This season, one of the best sitcoms. Is it really even a sitcom? It is a situational comedy. Uh, One of the best comedies in the history of television, I think. Uh, Silicon Valley, HBO. Watch it. She would would just lie, and I would hear her lying, and then, you know, she'd finally give in, and yeah, so that ended, to be honest, all that stuff ended for me because of music, really. Um, I realised it was going nowhere. I wasn't that stupid. Some of my friends were getting in, like, some, they'd stepped it up a bit. Right. You know, they were like going to rob the post office or something, you know what I mean? And I was, you know, it was like, there was only one little post office in town and like a banner claver over the head was not going to... You, you're like, you guys already know us by yeah, our names. Yeah, you know what I mean? It'd be like, it'd be like Mrs. Jones that. from next door. She'd be like, David, just go. <laughs> Who is this David <laughs> yeah. person? Yeah. No, I don't know I, what you're talking about. I'm yeah. Devin. It, it was a bit like that. <laughs> I was like, um, so I kind of was lucky. I, I kind of got found a group of friends that were going up to the east end of London and and were going to see some bands and bands like Susie and the Band, She's in the Damned and 999 and uh, all these, you know, um, The Clash and uh, and they were playing all these little pubs and clubs, Hope and Anchor, Music Machine and, um, you know, all these kind of places, the uh, Electric Ballroom. And and so I tagged along with them and... um, when I first saw Dave Vanium up there on stage, that was like, I'm going to do that. You know, it was like, uh, it wasn't anything about the way he was singing or the music really. Oh, I I love the damned. I mean, it was my first real love, but uh, I was a member of the fan club. They sent me a rubber bat. Um, And I, and, um, but when I, I would watch Dave Vanium like stalking the stage and um, I was like, "I, I can do that. (laughs) <laughs> I, could, I think I can play. Did you know you could sing though? Yeah. Not, re- not really. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I, ha- I, I was, I was from a very young age singing along to Bowie and stuff. You know, I was, you know, my mum's broom in the, in the, in, the, in her bedroom, like in her long mirror. You know, I was that kid, definitely pretending to be someone else from a very young age. Sure. And um, yeah, when I, when I got the. Uh, when I got the memo that I could actually do it and blag my way into sort of bands, um, 
when they asked, can you sing? I'd, of course, would be, yeah. I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was in a bunch of different bands uh, that amounted to nothing. The Vermin. Um, Great name, though. Yeah, The Spurts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Great names. <laughs> um, and um, they didn't really amount to anything. And then uh, eventually it sort of led to this, uh, oh, there was a, a bad, terrible band called The French Look that were kind of sort of, a bit sort of ultra early ultra voxy, right. very early ultra voxy, um, and I wasn't really singing or anything. I, so remember when yeah. Johnny Marr told David yeah. Cameron he was like, "You're not allowed to like the Smiths." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it reminded me of that where it's like, "Dude, you're not allowed to like." Someone us. actually commented on that. Someone said something. I drew that analogy. I thought that was a really good analogy, but it was absolutely true. It's like, have you listened to our music? Yes. Like everything about it is like. Just the opposite of what you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. Well, that's what's um, so. I mean, you know, when you, as you're developing, I mean, the only analogy I have is comedy. And when I think, like, oh, I'm going to perform jokes I did 20 years ago, I shudder and I go, those were terrible. I couldn't. That's, so- that's what there's certain songs you can, like, on the last tour, we threw Just Can't Get Enough in there again. And as an encore, and in a certain place after a certain bunch of songs have been done, you can come on stage again and then have some fun with that and, and kind of go there. But it has to really fit. You, you know, you've got to do it with, with gut, so you can't, you know, you've you got to have fun with it. So there's certain things that you just can't, you try them and they don't quite work. Um, so, yeah, it's the same, I would, I would imagine, of, like, old jokes or things that you did. There's certain things that you hear now, and you're just like, what? <laughs> it's, it's even, like, my voice, like, on certain things. When I was, like, you know, 10 years old or whatever, however young it was, I was, I sound like that. And to me, I'm like, oh, God, I can't, I can't sing that melody. Um, it doesn't, doesn't work for me anymore. But you have a – is there anything that you look back on now and you go, oh, I have a fresh perspective on this old thing – and now it means something different, and so it has this renewed meaning. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've been rehearsing a few songs this time that we haven't done for a lot of years, and there's certain ones, Everything Counts, for instance. Um, it fits right in now, and it fits right in with everything, all the uh, other songs that are on this new record spirit. So, um, you know, yeah, it's... I'm sorry, I just I got really distracted by your wallpaper. By the amazing yeah, Star Wars yeah, yeah. wallpaper? I was, yeah. The fuzzy I, Star Wars I wallpaper? I just completely zoned out. I was like, oh, it's so cool. It's so hypnotic. <laughs> it's, and it's fuzzy. You can, you can rub on it. Oh, well, it's all I will do that too. before I leave. Yeah, you can definitely rub the <laughs> wallpaper. But I, but I also... <clears throat> What is the feeling like? So you you go on stage and you you know you play for I don't know probably couple a hours, couple yeah. hours yeah. and you're taking and you're really kind of living through all these emotional periods yeah. for all these songs and there's you know fifty thousand people or however many people it is and then you walk backstage and it's just like now, yeah now it's, now, it's, now what happens? It's a bit like that. Although I I I tend to disappear. I just. Uh... I I get out of there as quick as possible and get to a room where I can just sit and stare at the wall for four hours. You know, that's kind of my what I do. I just, um, I feel so fortunately. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's we can tell some stories about that. Uh, waking up in various bodily fluids is not fun. And hopefully uh, most of them are yours. You don't know. <laughs> You're never quite sure. You're never sure. You're never quite sure because of the memory lapse. Uh, what? Where am I, first of all? What happened? And how did I get here? I'm in Munich, you say? Yeah, I mean, it, it, things like that happened to me. Honestly, they really did. I would. It would be like, I'm in, I'm in Amsterdam. I'm pretty sure I was in Berlin couple of days ago is that kind of thing well i mean even before then just the two like the touring musician schedule yeah I feel like that could happen so oh, anyway it, it still does anyway i'm still like it's the roadies i'm like still like <laughs> so, so, and, and they'll hold up you know so, so you're like, good evening, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. i still have that they actually put a big sign right on like where my monitors are oh, usually, that's hilarious. you know Bradislava. have you ever said the wrong city I have, I have, yes, I've. Do you I've get booed definitely... or are they like what? No, you just get kind of looks on front rows, like. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, that's yeah. Like but seriously, who are you? <laughs> yeah, but seriously, where it's great am to I? be here. Yeah. You. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I mean, what was that? 
You know, I, I, listen, you know, I grew up, I was born in 71, so the 80s were really my formative years. And when I think back about it now... You're such a young man, Chris. I mean... <laughs> It doesn't feel like I it. was born in '62. I know, but that's <laughs> only nine. You're only nine yeah, years. You're only was, nine but years. But that was that was. But that was. You know, I was lucky to be born at that time because by the time I was getting to be a, to just my early teens, like 11, 12, music was pretty cool in England. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah you we got just the we got the time. Pistols and the Damned and all these. But, but and before that, of course, I had Bowie and I T Rex and I, right. you know, so and then suddenly. You know, Johnny Rotten was on TV, and, and my mum, I hate, you know, was like, oh, oh, he just, he just, oh, he just swore. I think he just, <laughs> yeah. he just, I think he said bollocks. You know, and I was like, I was like shaking, you know, <laughs> it was so awesome. And just the effect it had on my mother, I was like, I'm in. That's what I'm, I'm doing this. This is what I'm doing. Well, it um, totally, like that era yeah. of, you know, because at the same time, you have this, like, British comedy explosion, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you have Python, you have all oh, these great... Was, yeah. That are basically just taking really button-up British yeah. culture and yeah. essentially just spreading their butthole. Yeah, I mean, Mon- Monty Python was, was like, the, the thing to watch. There was a few things, there was a few shows you watched. You watched Top of the Pops, you watched The Old Grey Whistle Test, and you watched Monty Python. And mm. that was kind of it in England, because when we only had the, all three channels... We had BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV, and and they all ended. And I'm always interested. I'm glad to hear you say. I sw- this is going to be the dorkiest thing anyone's ever said. But I tend to feel bad. I'm like I feel bad because you can't listen to Depeche Mode. Like, do you know what I mean? Because like, <laughs> you can't hear it. You the can't same listen way. to your own no, band and I, be like, this yeah, is so great. And it's funny you say that because people. I I, I never listen to my band. <laughs> I mean, like, because when you, you work on it, you, you do the thing. I mean, I actually only ever listen to a record that we've done before when we're making a new one. Right. And I sort of will reference. But you can't the like record. objectively. You no, know, and I kind of go, wow, it's. We, we we really did we, we did that different, uh, you know. And so yeah, I, and then when once we're performing, that's a whole, that's a, that's so almost like a different band, right? Again, it's like another thing. Uh, but it's cool to me to hear that you don't see other. I always think of my favorite. I'm like, oh, do they see them as rivals or are they like competition? But it's oh, cool no, to think of you being no. like, no, I listen to the. Well, Cure. that's also I don't that's hate also them. how innovation works when you're right. open to. I think there is a healthy form of competition, which is not ever. I must destroy everyone to succeed. It's right. Oh, they're doing that, so we should do this. And oh, wow, right. this is like yeah, that's how was, innovation there was, drives. There was definitely that in the certainly in the eighties with certain certain bands like around that time. Um, it just they kind of lifted the bar, and you were like, this is, "We were in with this group. This this is this is our gang, not this other thing that people kind of." And, and I think that was what was odd about us was always that uh, people never could quite put us in like a category, and so we weren't rock and we weren't pop. You were we just were, Depeche Mode. Totally. We were Depeche Mode. Yeah, it was I like, swear to God, I this is not. Yeah, I have never met a single person in my life who didn't like Depeche Mode. And I'm talking about people who like rap, punks, metal dudes, because right. I've worked in a bunch of record stores right. and stuff too. And you guys are like the Tom Hanks of bands. <laughs> right. Where it's like, no one That's doesn't cool. like I'll you. No one that. doesn't like you. Well, thank you so much for being here, Dave Gahan. And you can come back whenever you want. Spirit is the album, and you're about to do a massive tour. Yes, we are. We are. We, t- we set off. We're doing some... Uh, we're actually doing a little show on Wednesday night um, at the Masonic Hollywood Forever. Nice. Thing. Just no. for an hour. Yeah. What? So maybe we can hook you guys up. I mean... Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. maybe. So. We're just, it's just like a half show. We're doing like maybe an hour or something like that, but it'd be fun. It's, I think we could be there for yeah. I think that would be, be cool. I'll, I'll clear my schedule. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so then we're off to Sweden. We're literally the next day. We start in Stockholm next week, um, and we're doing all these huge stadiums across Europe first, and then we uh, we do North America in the uh, what uh, we call the fall. All, all the dates are depeshmode.com. Yes. You're welcome to come back anytime you want. Spirit is a new album. And uh, thanks for being here yeah, today. Ma'am. It was thanks an absolute pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very Enjoy much. Enjoy your burrito, everyone. Of course. Thank you. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. Very appreciative of that. Um, I, 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 you know, I literally thank things all day long. Yeah. I, I, because I, I went through many, many years not doing that. Not because I wasn't appreciative, but just uh, I just was on full steam go to try and get somewhere. 
I don't know. You where don't know that, where. I don't know where that is. Were you running to or f- uh, or away from? Bit of both. Bit of both. Um, definitely trying to prove something. Did to, you ever prove it? Um, I think uh, to other people, and then finding that that didn't really satisfy the need <laughs> at all. Um, and then over the last, like, I would say, ten years, kind of just feeling like, wow, I kind of. I did all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it, well, yeah. I think you're pretty yeah. cool, so I don't know if that helps. I did all right. And, like, uh, my I think kids I solved like your problem. Me, you know, yeah. my wife likes me. Um, I, that that I don't quite. That's still like a bit weird for me. Uh, the self loathing is still there. If I want to go there. Well, um, yeah, but that's what some some people go. What do you got to worry about? You got all the money in the I world. Know, and you go, I, get that. I know, but you have to understand that <laughs> the reason people become artists is because they suffer in some way, mostly, and that's defensive armor. So they either become comedians or musicians because they're yeah. trying to understand themselves. Well, I really identify with comedians. I, I, it's the ones that, the, the, you know, I sort of grew up with as well because that, that self-loathing and that, that kind of – but then been able to – that genius of being able to turn that into comedy – I mean, I've been in like shows. I mean, I've been in shows with comedians where I, I like, or a movie where I burst out laughing, and it's it's someone just like killed themselves, or something. <laughs> you know, and, and like, and, 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 and everybody else is like, and then I suddenly like catch yourself into my chair, you know, yeah. like because I I have this weird sense of humor. Well, the I? darkness never goes yeah. away because it's defense, yeah. it's protective. Yeah, I think so, and so I find that it's like, I remember years and years ago. I went to this rehab, and this this guy, this counselor, said to me, um, he took me over to this was one of these fancy rehabs, and there was horses, and he took me over to these horses, and he said, I want you to walk into the horses, and uh, <laughs> this is crazy. What I'm thinking about. This is walk rehab? into the horses, yeah, and uh, one of them's going to pick you, and I was like. <laughs> Dude, I, I I don't think this is a good idea, you know. Let <laughs> you know, the horse choose like, you. Let the horse choose you. And I was like, oh my god. So I stand there. These horses start sniffing around. I'm not very happy. I'm like sweating. I've just got to this place. I'm like detoxing. It was somewhere in Arizona. I'm like, who put me here? <laughs> you know. Um, and this horse came over to me, and it stomped on my foot. Like, and I had these little like like con- you know converse right. shoes on with no socks. Sure. And and uh, I stayed there for a little while, and then my real father showed up when I was about eleven. I came from school one afternoon, and my real father was sitting, and then my mother had had a few boyfriends in between, or kind of you know whatever. And so this guy was sitting in the kitchen, and um, my mother said, "You know, this is," and I said, "No," and she said, "This is Len, and he's your father." And I was, that, that was just, it just blew my mind. Like, so wait a minute, all that stuff. Of, what, what, Who'd we was, bury? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> who did? Who is that dude? Good, you know. Uh, so, That's yeah, such so, a head trip for an eleven-year-old. Yeah, I, lost a father to feel disconnected yeah. and to hear. By yeah, the way. I mean, and there's lots of. And what do you do? Were you like, hey, nice to meet you, Dad? No, not I'm really. 11. I was a little bit. I mean, first of all, I was kind of. He, he was this, like, he was a big guy, and he, he had, like, jet black hair. I remember that, and he sort of swept back, and he had a lot of tattoos and all these gaudy rings, just very much like me. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, like, like cheap gold jewelry, like mar- what we used to call market boy jewelry. And um, I thought. Yeah, it probably is my dad, <laughs> you know. But um, he 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 came back a couple of times and and took me and my sister out and and you know and I think it was explained to me at that point then uh, the the reason why I wasn't told was I was too young and we didn't he was out of the picture. My real father, who just lived thirty minutes away, um, was out of the picture because at that time it just dis- we didn't want to be a family where this guy kept showing up and it was like scandalous yeah that, but i mean it was like did my mum did it to as well she felt that like she was protecting me but i was the type of kid i needed to know stuff you know i needed to be told i remember once hearing my mum say to a neighbor across the across the fence like you know, David needs a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> you know, out of all the kids. Oh, oh. And I, I felt, I remember thinking, what does that mean? You oh. know, um, do, you, do you think that's true? I think it's In- kind of true. And I used it to my advantage by joining a band. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, 
and 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 get being liked by people and uh, that that know. never goes. Away. <laughs> like yeah, I, that I know, I know. Uh, it's kind of it is very. It, it's it's a real cliche, really, all of it. But um, I, and the truth is, I I kind of had a lot of mates that grew up like that as well. It was it was sort of. We we grew up on like council estates in Essex, and it was you know I, it was very difficult for my mom. I, you know, I think she had a really hard time raising four kids. Oh my god, of course, know, she had a couple of jobs. Everything we had was rented. You know, it was like it, sometimes the carpet disappeared. You know, the rug in the in the living room would be like oh because it because the, the, earlier you sort of hinted at like listen, I know appreciate, I know I'm very lucky, I can do it. You know, I have I have all these options, and I and I do think it's. For and most- I do. I really, I really, today, I, I, I'm, I feel fortunate that I am very appreciative of that. Um, I, 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 you know, I literally thank things all day long. Yeah. I, I, because I, I went through many, many years not doing that. Not because I wasn't appreciative, but just uh, I just was on full steam go to try and get somewhere. I don't know. You don't know I, where. I don't know where that is. Were you running to or or away from? A bit of both. A bit of both. Um, definitely trying to prove something. Did to, you ever prove it? Um, I think uh, to other people, and then finding that that didn't really satisfy the need <laughs> at all. Um, and then over the last, like I would say, ten years, kind of just feeling like, wow, I kind of. I did all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but well, yeah. I think you're pretty yeah. cool, so I don't know if that helps. I did all right. And, like, uh, my I think I solved like your problem. Me, you know, yeah. my wife likes me. Um, I, that that I don't quite. That's still like a bit weird for me. Uh, the self loathing is still there. If I want to go there. Well, um, yeah, but that's what some so people go. What do you got to worry about? You got all the money in the I world. Know, and you go, I, get that I know, but I know. you have to understand that <laughs> the reason people become artists is because they suffer in some way, mostly, and that's defensive armor. So they either become comedians or musicians because they're yeah. trying to understand themselves. Well, I really identify with comedians. I, I, it's the ones that the, the you know I sort of grew up with as well because that that self loathing and that that kind of but then been able to that genius have been able to turn that into comedy. I mean, I've been in like shows. I mean, I've been sitting in shows with comedians where I, I like, or a movie where I burst out laughing, and it's it's someone just like killed themselves, or something. <laughs> you know, and, and like, and, 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 and everybody else is like, and then I suddenly like catch yourself into my chair, you know, yeah. like because I I have this weird sense of humor. Well, the I? darkness never goes yeah. away because it's defense, yeah. it's protective. Yeah, I think so, and so I find that it's like, I remember years and years ago. I went to this rehab, and this this guy, this counselor, said to me, um, he took me over to this was one of these fancy rehabs, and there was horses, and he took me over to these horses, and he said, I want you to walk into the horses, and uh, <laughs> this is crazy. What I'm thinking about. This is walk rehab? into the horses, yeah, and uh, one of them's going to pick you, and I was like. <laughs> Dude, I, I I don't think this is a good idea, you know. Let <laughs> you know, the horse choose like, you. Let the horse choose you. And I was like, oh my god. So I stand there. These horses start sniffing around. I'm not very happy. I'm like sweating. I've just got that stuff more. Um, and then and then really around that time, that's when I I would I went back to I listened to a lot of Bowie. And I still do. Uh-huh. Um, Low and Station to Station and Heroes and those those records in particular, Joy, Joy Division and um, I, I was not listening to anything that was on the radio. Well, I think that you guys <laughs> yeah. kind of invented. It's like Chris was saying, being timeless. I feel like you guys were always ahead of the curve because like. Okay, my two favorite genres of music are post-punk and when people were first figuring out how to use synthesizers. And I think you guys are on the cusp of that. We were definitely trying to figure it out. Totally. The, the, only reason, the reason really we first used synthesizers more than traditional instrument, instruments. I mean, Fletch played bass originally. I, I, used to, I used to work the little drum machine. I think Vince played some guitar and he had a, he had a synthesizer. And Martin had a synthesizer. Um, and the reason was we they were more interesting. You could create more interesting right. sounds, and we weren't great musicians, <laughs> so you couldn't pl- you know we couldn't make these other instruments interesting. Um, and I think the uh, the electronics kind of gave us that edge to explore. Um, 
and and we were still writing in very traditional sort of pop music right. way. You know, it was still a, the same as the Cure and all these bands. It was a, it was in a certain way, but you had to have a sound. One thing I can say for all those bands at that time, whether it was the Bunny Men or it was the Cure or it was us or, or whatever, that we were all really different. That you, you couldn't really. Like we were, you could group, group us in. You could play us on the radio side by side, but but every band really had their own identity. I can't when I when I listen to radio now. If I'm just going, to, like everything seems to this. Like, right. Maybe I'm just like this old fart. Like, and I I don't you know. But I I can't. The only thing I really gravitate to is a lot of like rap music. To be honest, like a lot of stuff that I find is really. I mean, some some stuff like I mean, of course, not all of it, same as anything, anything else, but rhythmically and um, in a punky way, it's like it's like uh, modern blues or something. Or fucking with. I mean, it's, like, <laughs> I mean, it's just that idea of like fucking with whatever the system yeah. is. I, I think so. I think there's something about it that I find is really ballsy and. Uh... Well, also with rap, it's so much of it hinges on the personality and mm-hmm. the story of. Whoever the the lead guy, like whoever, if it's just one guy, yeah, there's it's real like, character. It's his story. It's yeah. his, you know, it is, it is, yeah. it, it's it's character and story, and, yeah. and you know, if, if he's telling an authentic story, then like you said, you know when someone well, means it. But that happened. I was, I, I guess that happened in New York, and and you know, there was all this mainstream disco, and then all of a sudden, in the in the the sub in the in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and these places, there was these underground parties. Um, we would do our utmost to. Just give him a look like that's 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 all you got. Yeah, like I don't. Even, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. And then you'd go into the bathroom, into the toilet, and literally pull down your, your tra- and there'd be like bloody wheels. Oh uh, my god! It was brutal. I mean, and the, the worst one though was a, a wooden ruler across the knuckles. Oh Jesus! Yes. Like when they hold out your hand and just whack it across. So it was a little while after I left school that then that was. Outruled, I think, and in England it was like, which is too bad because you realize how well it worked. <laughs> my mother used hundred million albums well, worldwide. Don't lie, Dave. It certainly made. He whipped you into shape. I used to go home and say, "Mom, you know, Mister, I, I didn't really do it." She said, "Well, you probably deserved it." <laughs> yeah, it was that's what I got from my mom. But um, but I remember being in high school and I went to I went to all boys Catholic school and there was this guy. Who would tour? This was probably '87. There was a, a guy who would tour around all the like the the Catholic schools, I guess. And he had a list of songs called the Dirty Dozen. Oh, nice! Do you know what that? Do you remember that at all? Do you remember what that was? I mean, it sounds vaguely it was familiar. Like, Where it was like these are songs that are negatively influencing yes. your kids. Yes. And all the songs were fucking great, by yeah. the way. Yeah. I feel like it was, it was a just, list of my favorite yeah. songs. I, mean, I was like, why are they? They're just yeah. Yeah. advertising yeah. great songs right. to, to kids. But there was a Depeche Mode song on there. Like, yeah, it's it's probably like Master, Master and Servant. And Servant. Yeah. yeah. It was we Master got a lot of stick for that song. It was. I, we didn't really get it. I mean, the video was pretty. You know, masochistic. I guess we were all kind of chained up and being like pulled around. We did the video in Berlin, I remember, and it was pretty bizarre. Actually, now I think about it. Um, but you know, that was we. Yeah, we were odd. We were odd guys. You know, we were all odd, and it was lucky that we found each other. Um, we definitely were weird. Um, you know, we liked Iggy and the Stooges, and we like it was. You know, it was stuff that we liked. Martin was a bit more like he was also already heavily influenced by craft work and and he was this but we both had Bowie in common um particularly heroes low station to station but Ziggy Stardust by far was like our I'm sure Martin learned how to play guitar to that album probably are you looking at other bands coming up at the time? Are you looking over at like The Cure or Joy Division? Look at these guys and go, no, they're doing this, so we yeah, should do this. The Joy, Joy Division for sure. I mean, I recently rebuilt a, a lot of vinyl by Joy Division. <laughs> yep. And I played a couple of albums, as, and I was just like, this is so heavy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they are shit. so <laughs> dark. But at the time, I was just, it spoke to me, you know. Of course. Just like tortured teenager. Oh, yeah. It was awesome. But now it's just the, the angst, just in Ian Curtis's voice, is, is, it gives me goosebumps. I mean, I love but I was the type of kid, I needed to know stuff. You know, I needed to be told. I remember once hearing my mum say to a neighbour across the, across the fence, like, 
you know, David needs a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> you know, out of all the kids. Oh. And I, I felt, I remember thinking, what does that mean? You oh. know. Um, do, you, do you think that's true? I think it's In- kind of true, and I used it to my advantage by joining a band. Right. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and get being liked by people. And, uh, that, that never goes... <laughs> it's yeah. Difficult I, to fill that I hole. know, I know. Uh, it's kind of... It is very... It, it's, it's a real cliche, really, all of it. But... Um, I, and the truth is, I, I kind of had a lot of mates that grew up like that as well. It was, it was sort of... We we grew up on like council estates in Essex, and it was you know I, it was very difficult for my mum. I, you know, I think she had a really hard time raising four kids. Oh my god, of course, oh, she had a couple of jobs. Everything we had was rented. You know, it was like it, sometimes the carpet disappeared. You know, the rug in the in the living room would be like oh because it the, it wasn't paid for or something. The right, rent, the television, everything we had was rented. Um, and uh, but my mother like. Re- really took good care of us. I mean, she, she, she really did. She did the best she, she, that she could. But I mean, amazing. Like when I think about it now, how hard it is. You know, it's just that's the hardest job in the world for a mother to raise children. It's just the hardest job in the world. And also, <laughs> and also, reading that um, <laughs> that you loved getting in trouble, like legitimately. I did. I, did. Loved I, I the sort rush. it. I sort it out. I really. I. I. I, I gravitated to. Any little gang of guys that looked like they were trouble, and I wasn't really a bad kid, but I got into a lot of trouble. I, I, by the time I was fifteen, I'd been in attendance centre. I'd um, been up in juvenile court like three or four times for vandalism, driving and taking away, and more vandalism. Um, it, it was pretty easy though where I lived to get arrested. Um, you know, it was like you know you didn't have to do much really. Um, and like I said, you know, it'd be the kind, it's the kind of town that like, if I was walking down a street with a couple of my mates, like a, a cop car would roll up on you and the window would go down and go, where are you going, David? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was that First kind of, basis you know, like, yeah, where, where are you going? Was, I'm just going home. It's, did you uh, guys take a car from so? No. Well, it has your fingerprints all over it. You know, it was that kind of thing. Or, or my mother would, this is what I'd hear as well, there'd be a knock at the door. Or my mum would come in the living room and she, I'd be watching TV and she'd be like, did you get in trouble? Did you do something? And I was to be like, uh, why? She said, well, the, there's a police car just pulled up outside. And I see, see, yeah. And they're so. I love the Banshee. The yeah. ba- amazing. Yeah. And but they all start. It's it's when you're watching the videos, you're like, oh, you can't really hear. You can't really make anything out. It's just loud and a lot of shouting. It but- was it was bad. I'm sure it was. <laughs> but it, I'm sure it was bad, just as we were as well. But but then it, it was, starts to form somehow. Yeah, it, yeah. But I think even when it's bad for me, it's so important because yeah. when it's bad, it gives you a I can do that too. That, like when you was, watched the damned, I'm sure they weren't look, that good, but you were like, I no, can do that right. too. That's absolutely right. I mean, in 1978, I sneaked into the back of Earl's Call where Bowie was playing and with a couple of my mates, and we promptly got thrown out. But I got caught enough of it to see. But that was just Earl's Call was like this huge arena, uh, which I think probably only held like maybe 8,000 people, but it was massive. You know, I'd never. Um, and there was. Bowie was like just something else to me, um, out of this world, uh, but gave me everything I needed at a very young age. To the, I felt like that alien that he sang about, right? And so he was, you know, that was my first love. But um, um, his music, um, but yeah, seeing Dave Vanium, seeing, um, I mean, Susie Sue was like scary. She yeah. was, she was just like. Oh my God! It was just she just was everything that this young man wanted. <laughs> yes. You know, she was awesome and so powerful, and you know, uh, it really intimidating. If she, if you locked eyes with her, oh boy, you could. It's just, you know. You, <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> darting all over the place, but she could just destroy you with her eyes. Um, but I was lucky I got to see all these bands. I mean, because quite often in those days, like 78, 77, 78, 
there would be like three or four of these bands on the same bill. It would be like, you know, 999, Susie and the Banshees and the Damned, you know, you know, uh, The Clash and, you know, Susie and the Banshees. It was just in, because then there was always somewhere to go. So I ended up like around that time as well. There was a squat in King's Cross in London. There was a lot of squats and it was full of punks. Um, and it was, they took over this whole building and it was right around the corner of the Music Machine. Um, so I used to spend a lot of time up there for it seemed like a long time but it was probably just six months you know? <laughs> what was the oh energy God, in so the, like when you're going to see Susan the Banshees yeah. and the Damned like what is the venue size what is the energy in the mm. room does it feel like oh this is this is something special or did it just feel like something really cool to do no it was totally <clears throat> it was like the thing to do for me it was a part of a gang I hung out with all these other punks uh, but I remember being in high school, and I went to I went to all boys Catholic school, and there was this guy who would tour. This was probably eighty seven. There was a, a guy who would tour around all the like the the Catholic schools, I guess, and he had a list of songs called the Dirty Dozen. Oh, nice! Do you know what that? Do you remember that at all? Do you remember what that was? I mean, it sounds vaguely familiar. Like, where it was like these are songs that are negatively influencing yes. your kids. Yes, and all the songs were fucking great. By yeah. the way, yeah. I feel like it was, it was a list just, of my favorite yeah. songs. I, mean, I was like, why are they? They're just yeah. Yeah. advertising yeah. great songs right. to, to kids. But there was a Depeche Mode song on there. Like, yeah, it's it's probably like Master, Master and, Servant. and Servant. Yeah, yeah. It was we Master got a lot of stick for that song. It was. I, we didn't really get it. I mean, the video was pretty. You know, masochistic, I guess. We were all kind of chained up and being, like, pulled around. We did the video in Berlin, I remember, and it was pretty bizarre, actually, now I think about it. Um, but, you know, that was... we. Yeah, we were odd. We were odd guys. You know, we were all odd, and it was lucky that we found each other. Um, we definitely were weird. Um, you know, we liked Iggy and the Stooges, and we liked... It was, you know, it was stuff that we liked... Martin was a bit more like he was also already heavily influenced by craft work and and he was this but we both had Bowie in common um particularly heroes low station to station but Ziggy Stardust by far was like our I'm sure Martin learned how to play guitar to that album probably are you looking at other bands coming up at the time? Are you looking over at, like, The Cure or Joy Division? Look at these guys and go, no, they're doing this, so we yeah, should do this. The Joy, Joy Division, for <clears throat> sure. I mean, I recently rebuilt a, a lot of vinyl by Joy Division. <laughs> yep. And I played a couple of albums, as, and I was just like, this is so heavy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they are shit. so <laughs> dark. But at the time, I was just, it spoke to me, you know. Of course. Like, Tortured teenagers. Oh, yeah. It was awesome. But now it's just the, the angst, just in Ian Curtis's voice, is, is, it gives me goosebumps. I mean, I, I, must, I, I love that, uh, anything like that. I mean, to, to, to this day, like, the, like the, my voice that speaks to me the most is probably Mark Lanigan's. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, you know, I listen because I, I, he's a singer. He's a real singer. There's plenty of vocalists out there, but, like, there's few singers. Uh, Johnny Cash, like people that you listen to, Bowie, like where you believe them, Billy Holiday, like they're, that, that's what I, that's what I gravitate to. If I believe the singer, I'm all in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm all, I'm all in, so. But it's amazing that you were Ian able Curtis to well, yeah. navigate the, because it would have been very easy to just have been an 80s band, but yeah. then when I went, when I was in college, I remember we played um, in my my roommates and I. I don't know. The horse chews like, you. The horse chews you. And I was like, oh my god! So I stand there. These horses start sniffing around. I'm not very happy. I'm like sweating. I've just got to this place. I'm like detoxing. It was somewhere in Arizona. I'm like, who put me here? <laughs> you know. Um, and this horse came over to me and it stomped on my foot. Like, and I had these little like. Like com, you know, converse right. shoes. I mean, no socks. You know, kind of no laces or anything. I'm Barely like, not. Sure. It, it totally stomped on my foot and and drew blood. You know, and I started laughing. I I just burst out laughing. And the and this counselor looked at me dead straight, and he just deadpan was like, "David, your pain is not funny." <laughs> and I was just like. No, it really is. <laughs> you know, dude, that was you told me to do that. You know, it was just I didn't get it at all, but it, it stuck with me that. 
like your pain is not funny. Like later on, it, uh, maybe five years later, when I was sitting in some hotel room, like, you know, with the crack pipe, like shaking, I was like, my pain is not funny. <laughs> you know, it was like, it came back to me. You know? But you, but you, I mean, it, it, it is because you went through a lot of really horrible things. Yeah. Well, self, self inflicted. I got to say, like, I, all that stuff, I'm very lucky to come out the other side of it. A lot of people don't. Um, I was lucky because there was those people putting me in these rehabs and taking care of me. and try- But I was often trying to escape uh, something. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I found myself in those places. That's why drink and drugs was, you know, when it worked, it was, it was the, the, the answer to everything. I mean, I felt great. I, I loved it. I loved drugs. I loved booze, you know, until it just didn't work anymore. Right. That's the awful moment when, you know, those years that you spend trying to make it work, and it's just not. There's no place left to escape oh, to. It was terrifying. Except for the ultimate oh, escape. And the rehabs and stuff like that. That was just, like, not my idea of fun. It reminded me of going back to, like, those places that I was sent to as a kid, like attendance center and just juvenile courts and just, you know, you've got to get right, but I'm not right. You right. Know, I'm not, probably never will be. And I think the real key to all that stuff is, and I was lucky, was you do have to accept who you are and how you feel. And that it's okay. You, you don't have to medicate. You, don't, you just, you know... Sometimes you feel like shit. You gotta. You, sometimes you feel like shit, and you gotta find people that also feel like shit. You know? <laughs> and uh, you know, and and you kind of, you know, it's not like you have to wallow in your own pain, but like, you know, you gotta somehow find a place where you can find it amusing. Comedy help help helps me. Always did. Monty Python, whatever it was, it helped me. Yes, uh, Easter. That's very British. We were asked yeah. to leave yeah, school. I was asked, exactly. like, basically, the deputy headmaster was, you know, gone. We wouldn't mind if you didn't come back <laughs> after. Like, you know, we wouldn't mind. Be like, I was like, all right, Ed. <laughs> it would be very polite. Yeah, you know. we, wouldn't we, wouldn't, we wouldn't miss you if you didn't come back. <laughs> it was something like that. And I was like, well, I ain't coming back. <laughs> Fine, we could Fine. use the space. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Great. Good. Off you go, then. More lunches for yes. everyone else. Good luck out there, <laughs> you loser. Well, that's... You know, what, you know, I mean, you know, so you... When... Depeche Mode became one of the biggest bands in the history of music. Did all were all those people like I always knew, yeah, boy, right. that they day he always. No, yeah. no, definitely not. In fact, I went back to Mr. Allen, you know, years <laughs> later, and told him I went back to the school, and and I said, Mr. Allen, you know, I knocked on the deputy heads, up and he and I was I was probably nineteen, twenty, and you know, made a few few quid. Uh, done it. Maybe bought my first like Escort XR3i or something. Oh, nice! Right, yeah, you know, like pulled into the school next to his little two Renault two CV, uh, you know, and totally. his, teacher, his teacher car, and uh, told him, "I was like, remember when you said I would amount to nothing?" I said, "Well, I, I, I'm something. Like I was on top of the pops." You know, was like, you <laughs> but know. he must have known that because there um, were only like three shows. I don't know, night. but it was I. I got immense satisfaction out of doing that. I think he. I mean, look, I was at school when corporal punishment still existed, so this guy caned me so many times. Oh, my God. I mean, whipped me, you know, literally. Like, you'd get six of the best. You'd go to his office, you know, bend over the, the desk, literally, and, you know, that, like you see in these old films, that's what we got. Did some of the... <clears throat> Did some of the undercurrent of S and M come from that? I think he definitely enjoyed it. That's for sure. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in we your... enjoyed pretending it didn't hurt. I mean, I mean, my, my friend and I, Mark, who would often end up at, uh, in the office, um, we would do our utmost to just give him a look like that's that's, that's all you got. Yeah, like I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And then you'd go into the bathroom, into the toilet, and literally pull down your. And there'd be like bloody wheels. Oh my god! It was brutal. I mean, and the, the worst one though was a, a wooden ruler across the knuckles. Oh Jesus! Yes. Like when they hold out your hand and just whack it across. So it was a little while after I left school that then that was outruled. I think, and in England it was like, which is too bad because you realize how well it worked. <laughs> my mother used hundred million albums well, worldwide. Don't <laughs> lie, Dave. It certainly made. He whipped you into shape. My, my, I used to go home and say, "Mom, you know, Mister, I, I didn't really do it." She said, "Well, you probably deserved it." <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, it was that's what I got from my mom. But, um, but I remember being in high school, and I went to I went to all boys Catholic school, and there was this guy 
who would tour. This was probably 87. There was... Uh, and, and get being liked by people. and uh, that, you know. that never goes... <laughs> yeah. I, to fill that I know. I know. Uh, it's kind of... It is very... It, it's it's a real cliche, really, all of it. But um, I, and the truth is, I I kind of had a lot of mates that grew up like that as well. It was it was sort of we we grew up on like council estates in Essex, and it was you know I, it was very difficult for my mum. I you know I think she had a really hard time raising four kids. Oh my god, of course know, she had a couple of jobs. Everything we had was rented. You know, it was like it, sometimes the carpet disappeared. You know, the rug in the in the living room would be like, oh, because it the, it wasn't paid for or something. The, right. the television, everything we had was rented. Um, and uh, but my mother, like, re- really took good care of us. I mean, she 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 really did. She did the best she could, she, that she could. But I mean, amazing. Like when I think about it now, how hard it is. You know, it's just. That's the hardest job in the world for a mother to raise children. It's just the hardest job in the world. And also, <laughs> and also, reading that um, <laughs> that you loved getting in trouble, like legitimately, I did. I, did. Loved I, I the saw rush. it. I saw it out. I really, I, 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 I gravitated to any little gang of guys that looked like they were trouble. And I wasn't really a bad kid, but I got into a lot of trouble. I, I, by the time I was. Fifteen, I'd been in attendance centre. I'd um, been up in juvenile court like three or four times for vandalism, driving and taking away, uh, more vandalism. Um, it, it was pretty easy, though, where I lived to get arrested. Um, you know, it was like, you know, you didn't have to do much, really. Um, and like I said, you know, it'd be the kind of, it's the kind of town that, like, if I was walking down the street with a couple of my mates, like a, a cop car would roll up on you and the window would go down and go... Where are you going, David? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was that First kind of... Basis you know, like, yeah, where, where are you going? Was, I'm just going home. It's, did you uh, guys take a car from... So- no? Well, it has your fingerprints all over it. You know, it was that kind of thing. Or, or my mother would... This is what I'd hear as well. There'd be a knock at the door. Or my mum would come in the living room and she, I'd be watching TV and she'd be like, did you get in trouble? Did you do something? And I was to be like, uh, why? She said, well, the, there's a police car just pulled up outside. And I said, yeah, I did. And she said, who with? And I'd say, so-and-so, a couple of my mates. We stole a car on the way home from school. <laughs> OK. And then my mum would, my mum would, like, go to the front Just door the when there was a, this was a policeman, hello, is uh, David home? Uh, you know, and she'd be like, well, yes, why? And she'd be, well, we need to talk to him about that. Well, he, he's been here for, she'd just lie. <laughs> oh, that's she, so would, sweet. She, she would just lie and I'd hear her lying and then, uh, you know, she'd finally give in. And Early. It was really early in yeah, the morning. Yeah, you were there before me too I as was. well. Which was. Yes. <laughs> I was it because it's it's far it's so far from where I live that I leave very early in the morning and some days I could get there really early or some days I could be late I just don't oh, know because of Trevor but I worked at K Rock in the nineties when it was in Burbank and it was in that weird That's office right. it was building. in that where you used to we used to have to go in the parking lot mm-hmm. if you drove in there and there was they'd announced it there'd be a bunch of fans there and they'd drive us underneath you'd have to go underneath and, and then go up yes yeah, so I thing. never really went in the front door. Of that place, but yeah, they were there for a long time, and then years and years ago. Um, it's funny because the other day I was listening to the radio, I was driving to rehearsals, and um, it was who used to be at K Rock DJ. What was her name? What was it? Well, there was uh... really, uh, really old. I'm talking like 30 years ago. Oh, I don't. She was. Um, it wasn't Tam. Dusty, Str- Dusty, Dusty Street. Yes. Oh my God. And, and she was on like the radio. And seriously, I was like. That, that can, can that be her? Because I, and I guess it was. She was doing like uh, she was on like uh, the, those shows of like classic vinyl. Or whatever. Yes, yeah. The, Sirius yeah. absorbed Sirius, like yeah. all the everyone, like all the K Rock guys, um, all the MTV people. But she used to be. It was K Rock was like a tiny little room, like it was just above somewhere, or this little like above a garage or something. Oh my gosh. And we got the same as same as in New York when it was like those like WDRE and right. stuff like that with these. You took go out to Long Island. Oh my god! And, uh, and do that stuff when radio was a thing. <laughs> it, it was I really, think it was it. different, wasn't it? it? It's sort of like I don't know. It's different now. It's I don't, I'm not saying it's bad now or anything. It's just it's just really different. Well, there was definitely a hit machine going yeah. on in pop music, but yeah. you know when K Rock is like coming out of 
punk and Brit and Brit alt rock and like everything that we all got in the mm-hmm. early eighties here in the states. K rock was you it was know, the one. Yeah. It was the one. It was the one. Yeah, and it was very. I guess much more alternative. Yes. Then it was playing stuff that you would not hear on the radio, like on the right. mainstream radio at all. Yeah. Same as WDRE in New York. That was what they were like as well. And predominantly, that's the only places we got played. Oh so. my god! Yeah, because by the time I started working at K Rock in '95, it already had become like a hit machine, and there were playlists, and you had to stick to the playlists, and it was already very. Yeah. You know, but they they kind of made it seem like oh we're yeah. just this ragtag, but it was a very right. programmed right. by that point. I uh, the lo- when I I um sorry, I just seem like I peed myself. Up. No, that's all right. <laughs> um, you want want you to be comfortable. If you need to pee yourself here, Dave, we're, we're very you're among nervous. Friends. Those days have gone, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, but uh, that's we can tell some stories about that. Uh, waking up in various bodily fluids is not fun. And hopefully uh, most of them were yours. <laughs> you don't know. You ne- 